I think we want to add to the Artemis Accords. And uh, of course, uh, the activities of, um, of the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs and UN COFUS are going to be very important. Um, but oftentimes, uh, in that environment, you have to bring a proposal that already has some energy behind it. And that's one thing that the Artemis Accords will be able to do for us. So that is, Artemis Accords is going to be a very central part of that international partnership. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Eric, as you're thinking about competition, you, SDA is bringing a, a new look to U.S. military posture in space. How do you think that uh, can create competitive advantage? Sure. So, uh, first of all, thanks. It's an honor to be on this this panel with uh, distinguished panel. Uh, thanks, Pam. It's uh, great to see you again. You know, one of the things we talk about what we're doing in in space. Uh, hearing you introduce Jamie, hearing you introduce Pam, really made me think about something about how profound this whole change in competition is. So, in Pam's background, right? So she has been at DARPA and FAA. Think about two differences in culture between those two organizations. I mean, think about that and let's take a step back and say, okay, well, how does that, how does that, and this is why I'm really excited to be on this panel to hear your insights in this, because that's a viewpoint that not very many people hold. So how does competition, culture around competition, uh, really help in the department and how can we continue to push that? Let's, let's pull that thread a little bit. So one of the key things that was mentioned when we talk about competition, why, why, are you, why do you want to compete? Well, as Pam mentioned, urgency is one of the key drivers. You know, SDA, that's what drives us every day. You know, our motto, Semper City, is always faster. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, the first one up there with the capability is the one that gets the capability to the warfighter, which enables you to actually do a mission. Uh, you can, you, if you get the 100% solution, but it's late, it's a lot worse than, than the 80% solution that's on time. And so that's, that, Keep pulling that thread, that urgency, that you've got to get things up there faster. And if you start to look at that, the way the department historically has looked to solve problems was on the, uh, on the view of competition uh, and cooperation. If you look at that as a spectrum, it has always been on the more, we'll say, the cooperation side. So as Pam mentioned, you want to use cooperation to make you more competitive. But you can, pull that, you can pull that a little bit too far on the other side, because if you really focus nothing on cooperation, uh, then you can say, what I really want to do is I want to have a designed plan, and I want to go with that plan. And in essence, I want to make sure that everything is engineered and can move forward. And historically, that's kind of how the department has viewed uh, how we're going to do our space architecture. So we have essentially set down and brought uh, you know, big thinkers, big minds in and put out studies to come up with what should be the overall architecture. Then we've essentially stamped that and said, this is what we want to do. This is how we're going to push forward. And this is, this is the, the right way to do it. And, and then we've essentially solicited for that, for that new architecture. And that's worked OK. Where it seems to fall down is in the urgency, in the urgency department. So if you look at what has happened commercially, uh, not only for commercial space, but commercially for space manufacturers that provide capabilities to NASA, provide capabilities to the Department of Defense, how have they been able to move so quickly? Not because they all got together in a consortium and said, we, this is what we all think we need to do to push forward and move faster. No, what they've essentially done is said, I think I have a product that will give me an offering in a market that I can sell, and I'm going to try to get that product to market as rapidly as possible, so that I can I can win a market share. And that's that's how it's how it's that's why there's been such a, an explosive growth in the space industry over the last ten years. And so, if you look at that, that is essentially what the Space Development Agency's mission and goal is. We are out there to try to set a stable market that industry can look at and say, you know, Space Development Agency, they're they're not kidding. They are going to fly hundreds of satellites every other year, and they're going to launch them on a schedule, and they're going to have competition, firm fixed price contracts, so that we in industry can know that if we develop an offering, we can stand up and, and, and validate a business case to essentially say we expect to win a certain market share 
We invest in that, we go fast in that, we know that there's gonna be a solicitation and we can win that market share. So that's, that's what SDA is trying to do, create that market so that industry can feel that there is this competitive nature so that they can work to, that they can work basically against each other, working with, uh, you know, with, with their competitors to come up with a good offering and then bid that and move forward. So that's what we're doing inside of the department to kind of push that out. And I would, I would uh, hazard to say that same mentality, that same culture of valuing competitive nature uh, should also promulgate within the department, not just what we, what we show outside. And so that's why one of the things the Space Development Agency has been emphasizing is that you do not need to have a one size fits all way to do procurement for the next generation space capabilities. It makes a lot of sense within the department to have multiple different ways to provide these capabilities and you can have runoffs to see which one can give you the best capability and then go with that and then eventually you might go with a different one. So that whole culture of competitiveness, we want to, we want to promulgate that outside the department and we want to emphasize that within the department and that's the way we're going to get these capabilities up as rapidly as possible. Well, thank you, Derek. You, we have been talking already a little bit about competition and we've used the word in to encompass a whole bunch of different things, right? You, you've been, uh, you talked about geopolitical competition. You also talked about commercial competition. Um, as I look at the proliferated Leo comm market in particular, um, it, it seems to me like the commercial players there are proceeding from a strong presumption of first mover advantage, or at least first mover at scale advantage. And some of that is just orbital geometries, right? If you've got thousands of satellites in a particular altitude, it's unlikely another operator is going to want to be at the same level, even if they have every legal right to be there, because operation is going to be complicated, right? Um, do you see that same dynamic playing out on the national security side? It sounds like you do. I do. So the way I view it, and this is one of the things that's, that's difficult, because what we don't want is we don't want an early competition that locks us in to a vendor lock situation, where if you win early, then you, you won in perpetuity. And, and the way we, we're planning on doing that within the national defense space architecture is to say, sure, we're going to have these competitions. We're going to have these competitions for the tranches, but we're going to define a set of standards. Now, the set of standards that we're using are based off commercial standards for, for comm and, and space traffic management, but we have to define something. And this is what we have a working group with, with NASA to kind of come up to make sure, you know, that we're all talking a same set of comm standards. They might not be the exact same standards, but we have, we have, you know, we have a roadmap on how they fit together. The beauty of that is uh, we can essentially force the performers in industry to validate against the government reference architecture for Tron Zero that's being run by the Naval Research Laboratory that they can plug into that architecture. Once they do that, then we can assume that, okay, this really is a true open standard and you can, you can then go forward and, and build and proliferate so that in the future, as long as anyone can build and design and test against that government standard, then we know they can plug in. So that's why uh, from, from our perspective, we want, to, we want to encourage that first mover advantage, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to lock the government into vendor locking perpetuity. Okay. Um, as I look across the two agencies that uh, you guys lead, um, it strikes me that there's some substantial synergies in uh, the kinds of services NASA needs, the kinds of technologies NASA can help develop, and what SDA is looking to provide in the near term and what SDA may need in the long term. Um, I'd ask each of you, how do you see the interplay between your particular piece of civil space, in your case, Pam, really the core of US civil space activity and, and what Derek's team is doing at SDA and then vice versa, right? Recognizing we have very different missions for our national security space actors and our civil actors, but we also have a tradition dating back to the dawn of the space age of collaboration, whether it is people like you, Pam, um, 
coming up as military test pilot and then converting into the uh, uh, astronaut program or technologically. So can we, could you guys talk about that a little bit amongst yourself? Yes, you know, the uh, technological cooperation has absolutely always been there. Uh, even when I was at DARPA, I would go over and talk to the aeronautics and the space uh, technology director, uh, associate administrators, because we were funding a lot of the same organizations. We would uh, have conversations. It's like, well, we're finished with this project, but you might be interested in picking it up. And, and we would do that. It would, there would be truly a, an exchange. It, it was, uh, so there's an ecosystem out there of industry that supports both. So increasingly, to me, there are two areas uh, that we need to really pay attention to. Uh, one is um, understanding what we're each trying to drive uh, technically so that we're not repeating uh, the work. We're not, I mean, I'm sure industry would be delighted to get double funding for the same thing, but uh, that's that's very important from the government standpoint. If we're uh, really trying to spur innovation, we need to make sure that we're, you know, we've got sort of uh, an orchestrated approach technically. And increasingly, we also have to be on the same page as policy because industry uh, can't, and, and I have seen examples of this where uh, there's a specific approach taken by defense uh, on a policy matter, and it's very different than the approach that is taken by NASA. And that is not good for industry because policy leads to regulations and oversight. So if you're not harmonized in, you know, clearly at the very highest level, national space policy, national space transportation policy, uh, but so much of it is stovepiped by areas like this is our policy for civil, this is our policy for national security. And sometimes when you look at them, even within a single policy, there are goals that are in tension with each other, right? There are things that if you did all one way uh, would actually conflict with another piece of the policy. So uh, how those things get resolved is by good relationships uh, and the willingness and the understanding of how important it is to work together. So uh, to me, those are the areas, I think they just have an increased level of urgency that we are working closely. And I'm, I'm thrilled with our relationship with Space Force, uh, General Raymond and the administrator uh, uh, talk freely uh, and often. Um, I, I think there's probably more to be done. Sure, thoughts from yours? So I, I completely agree. I would say that the two areas there in, in technology and policy, uh, SDA's view is a little different on technology. So from SDA's perspective, we really don't want to develop technology, right? Our, our goal is to field capabilities every two years. And you, really the only way we're able to do that is by piggybacking off of technology that's developed by folks like NASA and others. And so that's, that's what uh, one of the key things that we want is we want to make sure that folks in industry that are doing those developments for their, their, their civil or other, other uh, defense development, uh, technology development uh, partners, always are looking at how they can take those developments and turn that into an offering that will work for the, for the SDA architecture. So that's the, the key one. I think that, that uh, in, in us coming out saying that we want industry to take the technology that you've developed for others and apply that to our solution rather than force them to to meet specific requirements that are that are just SDA specific, I think will go a long way. So along that line, so one of the examples I gave is, you know, we have these these working groups on on different laser communication standards. Now um, there are a lot of different reasons why you want to do laser communication in space, and some of those will give you different technical solutions. So the key thing that SDA is looking at is how we can get tactical targeting data in a mesh network to the warfighter as rapidly as possible. Other folks are looking at, and, and NASA in particular, would like to have uh, a broadband mesh network in space, laser comm, so then that's going to drive you towards wide band, you know, very uh, high bandwidth communication in this, in this mesh network. So the solutions might, might be different, but you certainly would want, from SDA's perspective, I would want to be able to tap into that 
and NASA would want to be able to tap into us. So we're, we're working together there to make sure that if we're not using exactly the same standards, we have, to, we have at least a roadmap on how one network would tie into the other. So that's, that's where I think the technology aspect, we're, we've been working pretty closely and making sure that that, uh, that meshes together. On the policy side, uh, Sam's absolutely right. So on the policy side, we have to make sure that from the department and, and the civil side, we give, we give a unified message. Uh, our view on that from a space development agency is we, we essentially want to, to ride the coattails of, of what's being done on the policy side and just make sure that, that we, can, we can follow that compliance and give inputs where needed. The biggest one is uh, the orbital debris mitigation uh, space policy, right? So that, that gives the requirements as we start to proliferate in low Earth orbit, what do we do with all of those satellites? You know, do we, how, do we, how do we ensure that we can operate them safely, dispose of them safely, and what are the right, uh, what, what are the right time frames and what are the right technologies? And so from that one, we've been, we've been working you know, at, at, across the entire administration to make sure that we're all synced up on that, because those are the areas where you certainly don't want uh, the DOD going out and saying, look, we don't really care about what the norms are in space, do whatever you want. And the civil side says, no, we have these norms you have to follow. That's not acceptable. You have to make sure that everybody is, is using the same norms of behavior and, the, and that policy applies. It's an important observation. The, uh, and, and one where um, in particular, as we are extending operations into areas of space where we've had only very sporadic operations historically into the cislinar volume and so forth. We've, uh, we've got to think carefully about the examples we're setting and the, and the standards we're, leave, we're working to build. Um, let, me, let me shift to another source of, um, of leverage or impetus for, uh, for change and for accomplishment, which is uh, the beyond the money questions. How we organize, what strategic priorities we set. Um, I would say expectations right now for US government accomplishment in space are, are very high. And that's on the civil side, that's on the military side, it's on the intelligence side. Even um, DOD is in the middle of standing up a new military service, um, made quite a bit of progress, but a long, long way still to go. Uh, NASA just yesterday announced some significant internal reorganizations in order to focus and specialize a little bit, I think, as we are looking in particular at the human exploration mission area. Um, most of this, I think, is driven by the sense of urgency that comes from the competitive environment. In some cases, Derek, you know, for your agency in particular, like your very creation, I think was inspired by a sense that we needed uh, to at least try a radically different approach in order to achieve the cycle times that we need. As leaders of organizations in the midst of change, um, how do each of you think about those sort of uh, atmospheric or um, context items that help to keep your teams focused, help your broader set of partners to focus on the right things. How do you communicate that? And how do you uh, test that you're making the progress you need to make? Mm, well, the communication, I think, is easier than the testing, uh, although the proof is always in the pudding. Um, for, uh, for NASA, uh, I would say that the most important thing for us right now is to lay out the architecture uh, that takes us from the moon to Mars. We need to uh, understand what objectives we have to meet on the surface of the moon and in cislunar space to be prepared and ready to go to Mars. For, for me, that is um, essentially a top priority. And, um, uh, defining the objectives. We have science objectives, so we're going to have to do science development to understand. It's a big change when you have humans doing science on the surface of a planet versus uh, a robot that you plan two or three days in advance, the 10 meter travel that it's going to take and the exact instrument it's going to use. And uh, we, so we have um, 
you know, the questions around what science tools do we need? What are we going to need on the surface? How much science will we do on the surface in situ? Um, and think through how that's going to look. Uh, we have a lot to learn about operating on the surface of another planet. Uh, we barely scratched the surface of that during Apollo, and um, you know our knowledge base is very thin in that area. So it took us probably a decade to get highly efficient with crew time on the International Space Station to really, really understand um, that that, that uh, crew operations piece of it. Um, and of course, everybody understands that we have technology development that we have to take the boxes on. I think that's what people jump to first. They're like, oh, well, you have to build a rover and you have to have a habitat and things like that. But to me, it's a multi-legged stool. And I'd like to add the fourth uh, leg of the stool, which I consider to be infrastructure. So what is, what is the infrastructure? Comms, power, resource extraction, any of those things, you can open it up. You could add PNT if you wanted to. What are uh, those things that we have to develop to enable a sustained presence uh, and how does that how does that extend uh, to going to Mars? So um, you know, understanding that, then laying in an architecture. Of course, we can't know all the technologies that are needed. A great example is propulsion for Mars transport, uh, but we should know enough to know what we need to do to get to the point of doing an analysis of alternatives, and recognizing that this is not just a perfectly pristine and gorgeous technical architecture. We're actually living uh, in a world where there's multiple stakeholders and thinking carefully about starting from where we want to be in 20 years and looking at the capabilities. We've been very capability focused at NASA. We have deep space capability that's about to be demonstrated on Artemis One, hopefully before the end of the year. What, how does that fit? How does that fit in that architecture? And what role will our international partners play? Uh, one of the advantages of having a 20-year architecture is uh, you, you have a lot of options for other countries to step in and say, that's the part we want to play and, and lay that in. And I think that that makes for, um, frankly, both robustness, uh, but also resiliency. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is continuity of purpose. And uh, I think um, I'm, I'm really focused on trying to get a, a plan together that really has broad stakeholder support, including our international partners. So uh, that's, um, uh, I think, you know, the geopolitical drivers that we talked about. But to me, that's, that's the output we need to get to. Eric, your thoughts there? And maybe particularly you could say a few words on the, how SDA is thinking about the international partner side. Sure. No, that that's a that's a the great uh, segue to talk about. You know what what really drives it. So uh, Pam said it best: continuity of purpose. So one of the things, if you want to think about how does SDA communicate its mission externally, internally, and how do we keep motivated to keep this pace up, to keep this competition. Uh, I think that the beauty of that is that we have been given such a strong continuity of purpose message all the way from, you know, all the way from the White House down, and that is China. You know, our, if you look at what China is doing in, in space and their intentions around the world, uh, they are moving incredibly quickly to get, to, to get these systems up and, and to, to basically have, have different effects that, uh, uh, for, for our space capabilities. And so that is a very unifying mission that we can focus on and say, look, this is why, this is why we need to, this is why we need to drive as quickly as we can. This is why we need to push. This is what, what motivates us to get the capabilities up in two years, not 10. And, and that's, that's very powerful to be able to communicate that internally to keep people motivated, to keep pushing. And that also helps an industry to continue to drive this. Now, to your specific point is that also helps us internationally. So the U.S. is not alone, right? We have we have allies and friends around the world that are facing these same has the same continuity of purpose, if you will. And because of that, and because of the fact that SDA is standing up this architecture that is based on open standards, we're working with we're working with uh, with with our allies to say, okay, 
what kind of systems can you build to plug into our transport, which is our, our mesh network, that you can put your data on, whether those data be electro-optical, whether they be uh, RF-based, but you can place those data onto our transport layer so that we can move those around and move that to your, you know, to your warfighters in, in theater as well. So one of the key things that we have started from the beginning is to say, we are going to talk to Link 16 networks from space. You'll say, why, why choose Link 16? It's an, old, it's, an old, uh, it's an old data protocol. It is the data protocol that is most prolific, not only in the US, but amongst our allies. So that enables us to be able to tie to our allies. We can send data from our tactical data links, our targeting data, we can send that down directly to allies. They like that. You know, the, uh, the, the the Brits have been working with us closely because they have their their program, um, also named Artemis, but completely different than the NASA Artemis. It's uh, very confusing in the community. But the, the Brits have their, their Artemis program, which essentially is to get tactical data directly into the theater. In their, in their uh, vernacular, that means directly into an F-35 cockpit. Well, the transport layer can do that. And so we can work with them as they build out sensor networks to get those sensor data onto our transport layer and get that into, into their F-35 cockpits. Now, uh, we've also been working with, uh, with, the, with the Japanese to talk with them about, okay, they would like, they're very interested in, in missile tracking capability. So they're looking at fielding their own indigenous missile tracking capability. How can those data get onto our transport layer and how can our tracking data get from the transport layer into, into the theater that they're interested in. So we, we've opened those communications and we've got pretty close ties with, with those partners to be able to, to make sure that we share data because we're based on this open architecture standard that they're already designing towards. So that's what I would say. You know, we have the, we have the, the, the common purpose and we have open architecture standards that we're all building towards and that allows us to move quickly. So Derek, the, uh, you, you're talking about partnerships, both of you talked about partnerships here. Um, with a focus on external, international in this case. There's also a lot of internal partnerships required to get things done in government. Um, one of the innovations bureaucratically that SDA has brought to the table is a, uh, a sort of very different requirements approach, a much more of an iterative dialogue with uh, a council of uh, of warfighters, as you guys term them. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that is working and how that is, uh, what role that plays in your overall strategy for approaching your development and acquisition? Sure. I should say acquisition since you try not to do development. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, this name space development, we develop space, not space technology, I guess is the way to look at it. But uh, no, that, and, and in fact, so the, the construct of the way we do requirements was not. You know, we did we did not come out of that whole claw. So General Hyten has been pushing that for a long time. The the idea that the requirements that come from the department, from the joint staff of the department, should be very broad in nature. So if you go back to the way I, I started the discussion by saying that uh, historically what we have done is we have engineered the solution to the problem, and then went out and tried to acquire that uh, that solution, whereas where the requirements typically fit into that old way of doing business is the requirements would come, you would do the engineering of the solution, you would come up with the key performance parameters and those would be codified in as requirements and then you would acquire against those. Uh, and General Hyten has been for a long time uh, advocating that that's the wrong way to do it. What you should do is you should have very high level requirements and in essence, so if you, let's, let's be specific about that, what does that mean to SDA? So in essence, the two capabilities that we're, pl we're planning on fielding are beyond line of sight targeting for time sensitive ground and maritime targets. Detect a target on the ground that could be moving, detect a target at sea that could be moving, send those data to space, calculate a fire control solution and send those data from space directly back down to a weapon system. That's kind of the overarching requirement. That's a big picture requirement. And the second capability is advanced missile targeting. So you want to be able to detect advanced missiles in flight, calculate a fire control solution, and then send that back down to a weapon system. Very simple. So, you know, in General Hyden's mindset, that's what the requirements should say. Now they can say maybe a little bit more than that, 
one level deeper, whereas I, I basically say, now I want to make sure that I actually talk to field and weapon systems via Link 16, you know, but you'll still be at that kind of high level requirement set. And so that's what SDA does. What we do is we say, these are the requirements, these are the capabilities we want to deliver. Now we are not going to deliver those solutions in the next two years. We're not even going to give that full plethora of, of solutions in four years, but that's the overall view of where we want to end up. And what we do say is that every two years, we're going to launch a new capability that pushes us closer and closer to that ultimate goal. And you know what? That's actually going to get us to that ultimate goal a lot quicker than if we just say, we're going to get to that ultimate goal and we're going to design and build and that's what we're going to get to. And so the way SDA does that in practice, we have that overarching requirements set, if you will, based on those capabilities. We have a warfighter council that's made up of general officers and SESs from the combatant commanders as well as the services that meet every six months. And we present uh, at that warfighter council, we present, this is what we think we can do over the next tranche to get us further down that line, further down that capability. Is everybody on board that this is the right next set to develop and that is what would be a minimum viable product for us to declare success if we're able to do that. Once we get buy-in from the community, we snap the line, we say that's the minimum, minimum viable product and that's what will be fielded on the next tranche. Then we also work with that Warfighter Council. So obviously then if we're doing tranches every two years, you wouldn't need to have Warfighter Council meet but once every two years. So what they also do is they go and say, okay, the capabilities that we're going to field. So for example, tranche zero is going to launch in, in 52 weeks from now, it's going to launch uh, a warfighter immersion tranche. So what that means is we need to make sure that we can tie our space capabilities into planned exercises. So we work that out with this warfighter community to make sure that we're tied in, they're planning for us to provide data and we know exactly what we need to do to plan those exercises so that we can actually fit in with when we actually go to tranche one in 2024, we can actually have that capability. And that's works, that actually works pretty well. And I would say that, uh, you know, we're, we've got a lot of support. General Hyten's got the original vision of, of moving these levels up one level very high and pushing that down. And so we've run with that and just turned that into an implementation plan with the Warfighter Council. And it seems to have gained a lot of traction. So um, Pam, you're, uh... I'm, I'm, I'm struck that there's a, an untapped uh, mission crossover between your personal career and what Derek is trying to do. As I, I just realized, you know, you've actually got experience piloting a hypersonic glide vehicle and making aerodynamic maneuvers <laughs> of the sort that he's looking, uh, among other missions, to track. Um, as, but you did that on a system that was really a product of a traditional government requirements process, right? It was a, it was a, we're going to specify 90%, um, I'm making up the number, but I bet it's right, of the equipment, of the activity, of the, the cost of this is going to be government unique purpose, often pushing bleeding edge, you know, even down to the cliche of the pen, right, that we're writing. Um, the, How is NASA thinking about a world in which spin in or spin on is way more significant than it used to be and maybe every bit as significant as spin off technology? Right. Well, I, I don't think I'm wrong by taking credit that NASA has a lot to do with the growth of the commercial industry. I mean, I, I really think that the original idea, you know, back started with Mike Griffin, uh, the intuition that industry was probably ready to take cargo to the space station on their own. And uh, to not have NASA do a traditional acquisition, but instead partner with them. Uh, I can tell you, because I was at the FAA, or the licensing of the first commercial cargo launch to the space station, um, how disruptive an idea that was. And I don't think anybody a decade ago could have had any idea how wildly successful uh, that program would have been. And to put it in context, it's not just, hey, this is less expensive to take cargo to the space station. 
what ended up happening was uh, it spurred the rideshare uh, market. It, essentially, we were in a death spiral because the cost of launch was so high. We uh, kept making our satellites bigger and more redundant because, by golly, you just, it, you, I mean, if you actually got a successful launch, it had to work, right? Because if you made it through the launch and it failed, now you had to scrape up all the money for a launch. And, and I mean, it was really taking us in a death spiral. So uh, the, um, both the spurring of uh, companies like SpaceX, uh, lower cost access to space, and uh, activities at Northrop Grumman um, as well, plus the space element of it, the fact that we could get technologies and test them out a lot faster in space. I mean, it's crazy. A decade ago, I never would have said that we would be, uh, that anybody would be ready for the first um, fully independent orbital human spaceflight launch, like we saw in Inspiration 4 last week. I mean, I was like, yeah, they're probably going to get their suborbital, but it's going to be two decades before they can get their orbital. But commercial crew program enabled that, right? It's just amazing uh, how that's happened. Now, um, what's interesting about that is uh, I think NASA has been more successful than they could have imagined. And so there's a little bit of a, oh my gosh, uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, but in many ways, uh, we, what we have to think through is what is the approach that you take to acquisition for the individual thing? There are fads in contracting the same way there are fads in just about everything else that we do. I wanna point out as an example, the uh, iterative nature of what you're doing, Derek, is uh, been known for a long time in the software community as agile. And in fact, this was a huge topic of conversation at DARPA between me and the TTO director, uh, Brad Towsley, is, is agile applicable to hardware? Well, the answer is, it depends. So I would just like to point out that um, software, it's obviously applicable. If you have uh, the cost of development of a system is relatively low, in other words, trying to get to TRL-9, I mean, now that we have satellite buses that cost $5 million, right, or $10 million, you can actually afford to do that kind of iteration. Where it gets really complicated, really complicated, for example, on a Mars transport vehicle, now, we can do some iteration. We can try to develop a closed loop life support system on ISS, which is what we're, we're working towards. You can do technology demonstrations of, uh, and, and try to iterate through them for propulsion systems. But we're probably not building five Mars transport vehicles, you know, a tranche one, two, three, four, five. It's just too expensive, right? We, it would just, it would crush us. So you, you have to, uh, think about the right tool uh, for acquisition tool and contract mechanism and acquisition strategy for what you're trying to get at the end. Uh, I think that level of sophistication is something that we're all grappling with. Not only is technology more complicated, contracting is more complicated, and we're seeing options that we've never seen before. Maybe you have a cost plus CLIN and a fixed price CLIN on a single contract. Uh, depending on what you're trying to do. For me, that's a, a real area of focus at NASA that I think uh, we need to all up our game on that. And, and of course, the moon to Mars architecture is a great place for us to start thinking that through. We should have an acquisition strategy for every step. And when is it appropriate to use an iterative uh, method? When are you using broad agency announcements? Uh, and when do you say, yeah, we're there. We, we've got a one-off that nobody has ever built before, and maybe we need to take a look at the way we do that. Uh, maybe we use some of those innovative uh, contracting mechanisms to develop the technology until we feel that we have enough maturity, and and then hopefully just be integrating it. But yeah, it's a it's a. I don't have an answer to that question yet, but to me that that innovation in contracting and acquisition approach is something that we we all have to be thinking through. So uh, you just mentioned uh, inspiration for and, uh, civilian commercial orbital space flight, and obviously a, 
a big development. Um, that was, uh, if we look at, I guess it's now just last week. So, right, we had, I think the, we set the record for most human beings in low earth orbit, 14 up at once. And if we kind of run through it, that includes, I think three NASA astronauts on the space station, uh, two Russian astronauts on the space station, a European space agency astronaut, a Japanese space astronaut, uh, astronaut on the ISS, three Chinese on their new space station, um, and four people riding on a commercial vehicle. So that, that's more uh, all Americans, but four people riding on a commercial vehicle for, you know, admittedly just a few days, but again, that's a few more days than I've spent in orbit. Um, is that a, I mean, is this a moment that's going to be written about for in, in the history books that we've, we've more commercial astronauts were in orbit? I guess we can disagree about terminology here too in, in different worlds, but it, more people flew, flew commercially to orbit at that period than any individual nation had up with a, a national program. I, I don't see how it couldn't be in the history books. Um, it's it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, but, I, you know, I will say that I always felt as an astronaut that I was an explorer and a test pilot. And it was my job to pave the way for as many people as possible. Um, I think it's, you know, being the kind of person I am, I'm thinking 20 years in the future pretty much all the time. I've noticed. And, you know, yeah, what, what is it, what is it, what is the world going to look like? Well, it's completely obvious to me, there may not be a perfect analogy, but look at the aviation industry, right? We have commercial aviation. We even have civil aviation. Think about that for a minute. Individuals buying their own spacecraft and getting a license from the FAA to go to space individually. That, that's probably a little further away, but certainly uh, the idea, and then of course there's government aviation, right? We, we have a very uh, clear, uh, clearly delineated uh, aviation industry. And, uh, you know, frankly, being a military pilot is, is a different experience than being a commercial airline pilot. And it is also a different thing from being a private individual with a pilot's license who takes your Cessna out for uh, the uh, proverbial $50 hamburger uh, to go somewhere, fly around for a while, maybe go upside down if you have the right kind of airplane. So if we think of that, let's take a step and back and say, so why is why would space not look the same? You know, it struck me that the lines are all blurring, right? And and the gentleman who procured that uh, inspiration for a commercial flight is a line blurrer himself, right? He uh, one of his ventures is a contract provider of red air training to the United States Air Force, right? Where they fly military jets, contractors fly military jets to be shot down by, uh, you know, U.S. military pilots so that we don't have to waste scarce flying hours and U.S. Uh, military airframes doing, uh, doing that training, which is, again, something that 15 years ago would not have been. But it's a perfect analogy, Jamie, because the, if, if the U.S. government is procuring a capability from a commercial service that has other customers beyond the U.S. government, we get the benefit of the reduction in cost. So uh, I think that's, and that right there just sort of defines commercial space, right? It's, we get the benefit of the cost reduction. We all know bringing the cost of launch down, uh, you, you can do, make, make those numbers anything you want if you've got a high enough tempo, right? If you divide up your amortized infrastructure and the rockets, and if you have a high enough tempo, it brings the overall cost down, and it's it's absolutely the same thing. So, Derek, as you SDA made some key early decisions, um, commercial services versus commercially derived government, um, not just commercially, but substantially commercially derived government-owned systems. 
is that a decision that is um, reevaluated with each tranche? Are there circumstances under which you would make a shift to a, uh, a service-based model? Or is that too fanciful given the kinds of missions you're asked to do? Yeah, there's 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 insight there. But before before I answer that, I just want to want to point out, see that that last discussion. I tell you what, I got I got I got my price and mission worth out of that that last discussion. <laughs> now, so so think about think about that. You know that that discussion about the pros and cons of agile development. We we it, Pam's right. That that's what it that's what it's always called in the in the software world. We call it spiral development just because. It's easier for me to draw a spiral on the board and talk about it that way. But spiral development, agile development, and DevSecOps, right? There, there's all kinds of, of, uh, of uh, the same, same color of things. So one of the key things that you mentioned there was, you know, with what it depends. And I think you're exactly right. It's the cost. And not only that, but specifically for space, it is the cost of launch is what made, this is what I wrote down after this, because I think it it's summarizes what you said. Driving down the cost of launch is what got us out of the death spiral and into spiral development. And that's what it really enables us to, to push forward and, and do this kind of technology. So that's that's kind of one of the things. And so when we think about spiral development, I saw this presentation from a, from a, a rocket company uh, the other day, and they, they pointed out the history of telephones, automobiles, and aviation, and, and then applied that to, to space, which I'll do in a, in a second. But if you look at if you look at the last 20 years, uh, the change in telephones, you know, for, if you look at what has happened from iPhones and that capability and how that has really grown just incredibly. And then you look at cars and cars have, have you know, grown significantly, but not quite near as, as leap in technology as phones. And then you look at aviation, which really hasn't grown a whole lot. If you look at, you know, commercial airliners today, 737, commercial airliners 30 years ago, 737, not a lot of, of differences and what's the what's the main underlying difference uh, obviously the technology is is could have matured as fast and it is the cycle times so cell phones new cell phones completely new models come out every year almost completely new every year automobiles new models come out about every five years so you have a new model every year but realistically you have a major change about every five years on average if you look at you know the changes other than that it's just small modifications within the model in the aviation industry, you really have new major changes every 30, 40 years kind of time frame. And I would say that space has historically been in that aviation world where we've been looking at, you know, you get a new change every, you know, every generation, generation and a half. But now, because we've gone out of this death spiral and into spiral development, you know, we're going to push that to where we come out with these new capabilities every two years. So we're going to get somewhere between, you know, our goal is to get somewhere between the, you know, the, the cell phone development time frame and the automobile development time frame and somewhere in there. And so that, that's what we're aiming for. So now to your question, so what about the, uh, you know, how does that fit in with buying services versus buying uh, commercially or commoditized components that fit into the, the service? I would say that, you know, we, we will, we will reevaluate that. The reason we have gone from away from buying completely commercial services and just saying, would you please do this for the department on a service contract? Instead, we went with the model of, would you please take the technology that you develop for your commercial customer and tweak it just slightly and use that for our military purpose that we will, we will own and operate is three primary reasons. Number one, and you know, I get uh, reasonable people can disagree on this point, but it is something that, that we can discuss and this is more of a policy issue than anything. But we as the Department of Defense, uh, especially if you look at those two capabilities I'm talking about, tactical targeting and, and advanced missile detection and tracking and targeting, those are key missions that we have to assure that the warfighter can rely on in any time of conflict. Now, if you rely on primarily just the commercial service for that, that commercial entity could be a public company. Could be a private company, could be any of them. If it's a public company, uh, then it's going to have shareholders, and those that CEO is bound by law to have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. And it is unclear whether that fiduciary responsibility will always be 100% in line with what is actually needed to get the data to the tactical warfighter in a given conflict. And so, from our perspective, from the you know from the Department of Defense, we viewed that as 
it made more sense to make sure that we controlled that tactical data link comm channel so we didn't have to rely on any any other you know any other priorities that's number one and number two is the tactical data links we're talking about getting these data down to a weapons platform via link 16 or any other tactical data link there's no commercial market for that i can't my, my Cessna that I'm flying upside down in, I'm not, I don't have a Link 16 radio in there that, I, that I'm you know, streaming YouTube. There's no commercial market for that. And so there's going to, you're going to need to modify that commercial service anyway to meet the department service. And when you start to, we had these conversations with the commercial companies about how much that cost would be to do that modification onto their commercial service. And it was significant. So the point is you can't just buy the commercial service, you would have to modify it and that comes at a significant cost anyway. And then finally, the third one, and this is, this is very important if you look at what's happened over just over the last few years to now and what may happen over the next couple of years, and that is who do you choose as your commercial service provider? Because once you make that choice, you're essentially gonna be in a vendor lock situation. I mean, you, you really are, uh, you're going to have to change your architecture, you're going to have to change designs, you're going to have to plan for using a given service provider. Without naming names, I would say that if you look back three years ago, we would all be sitting here saying, we probably want to go with company A. Today, we would say, you know, company A, they're not looking as, uh, as, as reliable, let's go with company B. And in three years from now, we may be looking at company C. And so from that aspect, uh, we've chosen to say, we want to take that commoditized technology and we want to apply it, but we want to have it owned and operated by the department so that we can assure the service. Will we revisit that? Sure. I mean, it could be, you know, in five years from now, there could be A, B, and C are all operating their own networks, and we can easily plug and play in each of those, and it meets our purposes. But for now, that's that's why we've chosen to go the route we have. There's probably somebody in our audience right now thinking about founding company D. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And that's the nature of the commercial world, right? There, you know, we're... It, it, we as the government get the opportunity to get the benefit of a broader base, but we're also reliant on that company in an environment that we can't control. And if they're no longer competitive, then yeah, so you, you really, this is a lot more complicated than it looks on the surface. And Pam thinks 20 years out, that's further than I do, so I'm going to get stock tips from her after. <laughs> I, I think that's wise. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we are, we have several questions that are uh, pending from the audience and um, you guys are about to see them at the same time that I am as they're pulled up on the screen behind us. And I will let the audience see my better side. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's start with the international question we have up top. And there we have one that is focused on the uh, partnership developments with the uh, government of Australia and the UK. And um, Pam, I know you have personal experience working with uh, working in Australia on, on space activities. The question here is given the recently announced uh, AUKUS, AUKUS uh, alliance on top of the existing alliance and considering the government and commercial and entrepreneurial space activity in the three countries, uh, what are your thoughts on that alliance evolving to include the space domain? Well, I, I, would, <clears throat> I would perhaps argue that uh, the opposite is true, that it started in the space domain uh, with the Five Eyes. And that relationship is incredibly important. And I've always looked to that as uh, inspiration for the model of how we should be thinking about working with like-minded countries, even on the civil side. Right? It's very powerful when you share uh, your most sensitive intelligence secrets, which is the purpose of the Five Eyes. So uh, I, uh, I kind of smile when I look at the nuclear domain and I, I'm like, yeah, you guys had a good idea over there on space over with the Five Eyes. So I actually see that it happened the other way. And uh, I think one of the huge things we still need to press on Canada uh, has a very special relationship, not a complete exemption from export controls, but it's a unique relationship across that. Um, recently, there have been steps taken to aggressively push technology safeguarding agreements, which allows a, a, a much greater level of openness uh, with some of our Five Eyes partners, including Australia. 
And uh, I think, you know, at, at some point we really have to think about that because the will can be there on the government side, but there's a lot of barriers to our commercial industry working with each other because of the export control and ITAR uh, constraints. And, you know, government to government agreements help immensely because you're essentially saying from a policy standpoint, we want to work together and share. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would argue that question was inverted. Derek, do you have any thoughts on the Alliance side there? Is that where? No, I mean, I think that's, that's a really good way to look at it. This was all started in space from SDA's perspective. I mentioned how we're, we're teaming with the, the UK and Australia. We're, we're working with them to look at possibilities about putting some of our, our ground site locations there to be able to, to help a little bit more with that, with the, 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 the theater in that, in those regions. But uh, I think that space has been plowing that ground. The, uh, there's a second question we have up here, which is more, I would say, foundational. And it gets to, uh, I think, do we have the right skill sets and ways of looking at, uh, at the space domain from a, a business perspective? So the question is, is what's the role of business schools? Uh, the questioner believes there is no graduate business program researching and teaching with a focus on space commerce. Um, each of you are touching that uh, elephant from a slightly different perspective, but uh, do you think we have the intellectual frameworks we need, or do we need more uh, R and D on the uh, on the thinking side here for uh, for how to approach space commerce? It's an interesting question. It, it is. You're thinking I'm, twenty years down. Well, the road. I'm sitting there thinking there's the uh, there's the blue ocean on. on uh, backup, uh, you know, if, uh, if I need a, a backup opportunity, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I'm, I'm minded to think that space law was very niche with only a couple of places that you could take a space law course uh, or actually focus in that. And that's really changed over the last decade. There's a lot more interest in it. And I think uh, it's a very interesting idea. And uh Actually, I think it's a wonderful idea that, that you know, this, is, again, things have really changed a lot in the last te decade, but it's a decade. So we have some case studies to go back and potentially build a perspective, but it is changing so fast. I mean, just, just ask yourself, is this back a good idea or not for my company? And then and, and see the wave in technology companies, including space. It's probably going to take it another five to 10 years for us to figure out if that was a good idea or not, or when, like, what are the criteria? So this is, uh, it, it, that would be fascinating. Thank you. We have another really easy question here from a colleague at Kness, which is asking, uh, regarding cooperation with like-minded nations to cope with the urgency that our speakers have been mentioning, uh, could the U.S. federal market be open to foreign private companies from like-minded countries if they, on, if they offer the most appropriate solutions? And if so, what would be the modalities to have access to some U.S. federal government contracts, such as from your two agencies? Well, so from the SDA perspective, we, you know, we have our open solicitations and we have, uh, you know, we have foreign companies that can bid on those. There are, you know, there are Buy America uh, Act uh, places in, in law that certain fractions and, and percentages have to be, have to be U.S. For, for some of those. But certainly we, on our tranche zero, we have foreign participation with foreign companies. Uh, some of those are, are doing an excellent job supplying the optical crosslinks and, and activities such as those. So that's something we're, we're open to. Uh, we, we typically, obviously, because of the, the national security aspects of this, we, we want to rely on domestic uh, capabilities wherever we can, but it's, it's not ruled out. That's absolutely right, Derek. Actually, it is uh, enshrined that if that there is no domestic capability that has the same performance level, uh, it is enshrined in our federal acquisition regulations that it is permissible. Um, the, the practicality uh, of it though is a little different sometimes. And uh, this sort of goes back to what I was talking about, how government to government agreements 
and I would point to the International Space Station as an example of that, where our uh, different countries, companies have to work with each other, right? One, one country is funding their industry to do a piece. We're funding our industry to do a piece. And of course they have to work together. And it's just my observation um, that that breaks down the barriers, the fear of export control, the, oh, I don't wanna deal with this, I'll be in charge of it. And it's a headache and it's a hassle. Uh, and you get over that into a, hey, we can partner on this stuff. And so I, 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 think, um, I think we still have a ways to go. I mean, even with uh, technology safeguarding agreements, there's still hesitation. There's absolute hesitation on the part of industry to industry. Uh, and, and so it's so rare that like one company is doing a, a whole system for you, right? They have to have some subcontractors and so that industry barrier, the barrier on the industry side is very real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm uh, reminded of a, a uh, conversation I had uh, with a uh, recently retired Canadian military officer who served in highly classified places in US military installations uh, on on the organic staff uh, as part of that alliance relationship, who uh, I was potentially looking to hire in a nonprofit defense contractor to work on unclassified issues, but it was uh, impossible because uh, it would have required uh, an escort of the foreign national everywhere to work on unclassified spaces on the contractor basis. Someone who would literally just stepped out of top secret spaces as a allied officer. So that's right. Government to government is a different, uh, different yeah. beast. It, it enables things. And then once they learn how to work together, then uh, you see the partnerships form, but it's hard. The uh, we've got um, one more pointed question to Pam that I think might be a, a potentially a short answer, which is uh, ISS2, question mark. Uh, you focus on creating an ISS2. Yes, so, uh, so I think we've been very clear on the fact that we think that uh, the, there's enough interest and capability. In fact, we just uh, issued, uh, I believe it was an RFI, and got some uh, more than 10 uh, responses interested in uh, a future commercial LEO destination. So uh, this is another one of those things. I mean, it was an intuitive leap about commercial cargo. Like, are we really ready for this uh, that Mike Griffin made? And, it, you know, I, I asked him once, what was your data? And he was like, it's just kind of an intuition working with industry. It was a gamble. So we're more or less in the same position, although I think we have access to more information now, having seen our cargo and crew uh, partners uh, unfold their capabilities uh, far faster, I think, than anybody believed possible. So uh, we do think that the follow-on to ISS should be a commercial destination. Um, we, we think that's what we need to move towards. We're very well aware that the full market is not yet developed for that and that we need to work with our partners uh, our industry partners to help figure out how they can uh, just even let people know what's possible uh, at, at a, on a destination like that. So a few, you know, high profile things like private astronaut missions certainly get people's attention, but I think there's so much more, especially in the area of commercial uh, company research. Yeah. Uh you know, one of my colleagues at our Center for Space Policy and Strategy has done some really good work on where public-private partnerships work and where they're really just government procurement by another name. That, and uh, I think really understanding what does constitute a real commercial market or what over time, if a couple of things go right, could. Right. It seems unlikely that the government would not be an anchor tenant, right, at least to begin with. Um, we talked about a number of game changers from a technology or business model perspective here so far. And I want to, in our final few minutes, introduce uh, one other potential game-changing technology topic, which is 
um, on orbit service assembly manufacturing. Right. Um, we talked about getting out of the launch death spiral of cost as an enabler that has allowed a, a whole ton of things that couldn't have happened before to happen now from an economics perspective. That's another one that can break us out of some of the tyranny of the rocket equation and you know the, the trade-offs between uh, space and volume uh, on board. How, and I think it's of applicability to both organizations' missions potentially down the road. Um, you know, Derek, as you're looking at large constellations, the uh, safety orbit that you brought up with the ODMSP issues, um, on-orbit servicing could be a part of a solution there for the whatever percentage of your fleet ends up having failure. Um, obviously, huge application for science and exploration missions. How are each of you thinking about that as if sort of on the cusp uh, technology game changer for your organization's missions? It's uh, a very interesting area, and it's kind of interesting to see the change again over the last decade because there was sort of a chicken or the egg thing. I mean, the only spacecraft that could be on orbit serviced were the shuttle, the ISS, and Hubble, famously Hubble. And uh, so why build a servicer if it's not possible, if you're not designed to do servicing? And uh, when I was at DARPA, we were pushing to break the paradigm by building a robotic capability uh, that would enable servicing, even if you were not designed for it, to try to cut through that. In addition to that, you know, Northrop Grumman's MEV, I think, has shown what's, uh, what is also possible. The challenge with this and the exciting part of it, when, when I was looking at it as from a technology development, is all these intersections, right? It's orbital debris mitigation. Is it uh, life extension? Is it uh, upgrade? So, you know, my perspective on this is that life extension is a really good commercial market uh, because if you, for example, have a commercial telecommunications satellite in geo in a very uh, lucrative market, once you've amortized the cost of your launch, you're basically printing money at that point, right? It's once you've amortized that those costs. So life extension makes a lot of sense. But our, our uh, national security partners look at it differently and they're like, no, we want, we want to upgrade the latest technology. We want to, and interestingly from you know, my community, the science community it, inside NASA, they see things the same way, right? They want to upgrade just like we did Hubble. So it's a, it's a slightly different purpose. But one of the things that I think that's uh, probably going to come in from a different angle and really change this is that if we're going to do better commoditizing satellites to bring the cost down, right? Now you're going to something that's been talked about for years, modularity, uh, orbit replacement units and things like that. Those things will, um, will make more sense. And if it becomes modular, then that means you can repair it. You can, you know, swap out a piece because they're all very similar. They'll have similar uh, handles on them and things to use. And so I think that uh, that aspect of servicing is going to probably accelerate the modularization uh, and commoditization basically that's happening in the satellite community. And that uh, could have an enormous impact. So one of the, uh, the visions that I had when I was at DARPA was for an immortal geostationary satellite that was modular so that you could just, if something broke, you just get a servicer up there to swap the part out, but you could rent space for payloads on it and swap those payloads out uh, whenever they were needed. So that's one, uh, that's one model um, that, that could happen. But you know, to me, all those things are really important. I think they're all happening now and they're gonna continue to happen. But I'm watching very carefully about this modularization piece. So if we buy into an orbital condominium, is there going to be a homeowners association? So my aspect. So I, I you know, I've uh, changed my opinion on various aspects of space over over time. I'll say that the most uh, profound one. So when I was a DARPA PM, uh, so this is around the 2010 time frame. I was uh, working on 
large uh, space programs, you know, and, and I was a firm believer that small sats were, were not, they were going to be useful for burning down technology risk, getting things to TRL-9, maybe doing some tech demos, but no real mi missions. I remember there was a PM uh, in my cohort there, Dave Barnhart, and he and I used to have a lot of discussions about that. Like, yeah, yeah, Dave, okay, I see, I see the satellite you have on your table, it's nice, but, you know, we, we really need, you really need power aperture to do these missions. And uh, around the 2015 timeframe, I was in industry, and that's when we first started flying missions that were doing real national security missions from very small satellites. And the scales fell off my eyes at that time. And I said, okay, I'm a believer now. I was wrong before. Uh, small sats are really a way to do a lot of these missions that I didn't think were possible before. And I'm on that, uh, that's, that's kind of where I am right now with the, with the servicing. There's two aspects of servicing. So there's the, you know, the on-orbit servicing, a lot of, a lot of as, as described by Pam, I'm not quite there yet on that one, but I'm, I'm getting closer. But then the other one is the, the orbit servicing. So your, your tow truck in space. And that one, you know, I was, I never really thought that there was a huge market for that. You start to do the, the business calculations and it, it can go, it can go either way. But let me tell you, when, when we look at the, you know, the intricacies and the difficulties involved with flying satellites, flying a constellation of satellites that are above the 600 kilometer limit. So that above 600 kilometers, you last longer in orbit than your 25 years. So by the ODMSP, the, the Orbital uh, uh, Debris Mitigation Space Policy, you have to have some way to, to bring that down. And ideally you would be able to positively deorbit that so that you could control where it landed, right? So that you, there's no, no, uh, uh, no threat to, to human life. So when you start to look at that and you start to look at the cost imposed on every satellite to be able to do that, to be able to make that, and you say, you know, then now there is starting to be a market that if there was a tug, which you didn't care how long it took, if it took it, if it took it a year to be able to move it into another orbit, to deorbit or, or to raise it from a lower orbit up, you know, that that's okay. Um, from that perspective, I've changed my mind and I think there is a future. For, for orbit servicing uh, as, as we continue to, to proliferate these, these satellites in orbit. Uh, it just makes a lot of sense to have, you know, purpose-built satellites that, that can do this maneuvering. As far as the- make news today, would you be looking at specking that in on a future tranche of, of grappling fixtures or uh, docking capability? No, I'm not gonna say that right now. <laughs> that, that goes, again, that goes to, the, so ideally, the SDA model would be that we would never spec that in because what we would do is we would say, uh, it is your responsibility to launch and deliver your satellites in a given orbit. Um, in compliance with ODMSP. In compliance with ODMSP and to, you know, to, to dispose of it in compliance with ODMSP. And we don't care how you do that. Just explain to us how you do it and, and we can make that determination. That's what SDA originally intended for our tranche one launch also. Um, but uh, we, we didn't go that way on tranche one, but in, in the future, we, we may actually go that way. So we would, so I would never go on record saying, I'm going to spec out a specific, I'm going to say, this is the capability I want delivered on orbit. I don't care by hook or crook, you get it there and you get it to a disposal orbit, you make that happen. But you'd, I, allow, you'd allow a vendor to make the trades between however many nines of reliability they need on their deorbit system device. Absolutely, absolutely. Now for tranche one, uh, we weren't given that flexibility. So for tranche one, we're, we're specifying, you know, you use national security space laws phase two to go that route. So that takes some of that, some of that off of the vendor and, and take, you know, they don't, they don't have that flexibility, but absolutely in the future, that's the way I think it should be specified. And I would say, you know, on the other aspect, the actual on orbit servicing for re replenishment, uh, repair and replenishment of, a, of individual, we're focused on space development agency is commoditized, affordable proliferation. So it doesn't really fit that that model. But certainly there are you know there are markets where it's it's a much better fit. And there, like I said, I used to think that there wasn't a business case, just like on small sats. But I'm on that cusp now that say you know I I could have been wrong. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Derek. Low Earth orbit is actually the toughest uh, case to close for OSAM with the exception of what you just talked about. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, again, with a few exceptions, like, you know, our crown jewel, the International Space Station, we're moving towards a disposable environment in LEO. Uh, but I think you'll see, still see lots of non-disposable systems uh, at other orbits. 
so the first the first economically viable market there may be the tow truck not the potentially not the roadside repair <laughs> yeah um this has been really productive i think uh, i certainly learned a lot from this conversation we have just a couple minutes left um, i'd like to offer either of you opportunity to inject any points that you think our uh, audience needs to know today if they're going to make sense of the emerging space environment I just have to say Semper Sidious. Well, I, you know, our, I think the emerging environment is competition to get, get us the capabilities on orbit as rapidly as possible. Well, we didn't have a chance to explore the climate change uh, piece, and that's okay. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, so essentially important. And I, I'd like to just make a comment about how I think it fits into the discussion that we've had. Um, I'd like to say that my personal experience on orbit, this is one of those things that you begin to realize that pretending what is happening on one side of the earth is not actually affecting the other side of the earth um, is just immediately obvious that it's wrong. That the things that, uh, especially when you're uh, looking at aspects of things like emissions and uh, in other ways, we're interacting with our environment. You, you can see that it is a connected system and it's very obvious. So pretending that one country meeting its obligations or whatever, you know, I'm good here, nothing to see here. It's those other people that are doing bad things. It, that's not the way we can think about this from the future. Uh, the more private astronauts we have and people in space, I hope they will have the same insight and the same recognition. Uh, but this aspect of international partners who are like-minded and uh, see this the same way, it's the only way we're going to tackle this. So NASA's role, of course, in this is as the eyes in the sky. Uh, but I, I believe aspirationally that, that uh, the view that we get of our Earth, uh, and especially the further we get away from it so that we actually see it as our spaceship that we live on and that we're, we're all crew members of, uh, I think will actually help with some of the culture uh, issues and help us come together to solve that problem. Yeah, thank you, Pam. And I, I apologize. I had written down climate with two underscores on it, and I didn't get it back. Uh, <laughs> and the uh, it, it it really does help open that there is a substantial subset of issues where even in the context of geopolitical competition. If we fail to successfully cooperate and you know build the context in which cooperation is possible, uh, we will be very much worse off uh, on a species level and on a national level. Um, and so perhaps we can uh, hold that for a future day and dig into that the uh, the cooperation side and the uh, building consensus on action side in an even greater depth. So again, my thanks to the panel here, uh, to Derek and Pam, both of you are uh, incredibly busy leading disruptive agencies doing very important things to the nation. So we're, we're grateful for your time. Uh, so on behalf of both the Center for Space Policy and Strategy and George Washington's Space Policy Institute, very glad to have had you and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, it was fun. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, my uh, apologies to our uh, our hybrid uh, audience. Uh, in typical fashion, we went for 15 minutes, but it turned into the Washington 25 minutes. Um, so we had a, a good time here uh, talking uh, amongst ourselves and uh, and with our tremendous uh, first panel. Um, so what I'd like to do, we're starting. Uh, we have a little bit of margin to work with, uh, which is uh, unusual in the space business. Uh, so we're starting a little early uh, here at, uh, at 11 o'clock. And uh, I want to introduce uh, the second panel, 
Uh, I'm talking about with the rather intimidating title of the intersection of cloud, AI machine learning and space policy. Uh, an interesting overlapping Venn diagram. Uh, the, uh, the modern information architecture uh, that is developing and is exciting, of course, has all these things in it. Uh, cloud is, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the term, term du jour, of course, been around for some time. Uh, roles of machine learning and AI, of course, are transforming many information intensive industries, which, of course, is what the, the space industry is, is about. And we've had uh, new companies, new entrants, uh, technologies coming into uh, this environment. And so the space business is not merely that of aviation, uh, bending metal, uh, rocket engines, and so forth, uh, but also is increasingly an IT environment. And we can go over lots of examples of that in the different, the different sectors. Uh, but IT is transforming uh, multiple industry sectors and space is really, really no different. Uh, to give us a orientation into uh, what's going on in this area from uh, Aerospace Corporation, uh, we have uh, Stephen Marley, who uh, has a, a project he's currently working on, on re-engineering space for the cloud. And he's going to talk about some uh, very preliminary uh, findings from this effort, uh, but as a way of really setting the scene uh, for the transformations that they see happening. Uh, we have a number of friends on the panel, uh, Sarah Monero. Uh, I won't attempt to pronounce the name of the company she's with. I'm told it's an Elvish, um, but uh, 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 she is a senior director for space there. And of course, long time experience on, on the Hill uh, and in DOD and uh, sort of tremendous experience across multiple sectors. Hank Su um, uh, from OneWeb, a director of software architecture. So someone who is implementing a lot of these strategies uh, in the services that are uh, coming on the market uh, presently. Um, appropriately, uh, uh, virtually, we have uh, Dan Brennan, uh, who's uh, joining us uh, there in, in background, from Oracle, Senior Director of Mission Cloud Solutions, uh, someone who's been in the business a long time. I'm told some of his code is still running in Cheyenne Mountain, uh, and uh, which should both be reassuring and frightening at the same time. Uh, Lindsay Millard, uh, Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for R&E, uh, Principal Director uh, for Space, also someone uh, with long experience not only in government but also in industry, uh, and uh, so it is, uh, brings that ability to translate uh, across these multiple communities. And look forward to uh, her talking about the challenges that R&E is seeing for DoD on the cutting edge of these subjects for space. Um, and then finally, we have uh, we have Cheryl uh, Olgan, also from Aerospace uh, Corporation, Senior Project Engineer on Ground Programs, a uh, topic that is usually neglected. People like to see the rockets and the satellites, uh, but as most congressional staffers know and OMB examiners, it's the ground systems that will kill you. Um, so therefore, uh, pleasure to have her on there. Uh, you can read their rather extensive uh, bios in the back. I won't be going through uh, all of that. Uh, in terms of format, what I'd like to do is uh, just simply go down uh, the presentation list, have each panelist uh, uh, give a, a few remarks, uh, uh, say five, uh, five, seven minutes or so, um, and then we'll shift into, uh, into a discussion. And uh, with that, we look forward to a lively exchange. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephen? Thanks very much, sir. Um, so thank you for the Space Policy Institute for inviting us here. Um, Cheryl and I have been uh, working for about a year now on a, uh, on, on a piece of research which will be developed into a policy paper here within the coming months that was prompted by several uh, act activities that are going on in space and cloud uh, businesses where those trillion dollar age, uh, businesses are going, to, uh, are going to merge. The sorts of things which were interesting to us was sort of research by organizations like, uh, like Northern Sky that talk about a $20 billion dollar cloud business in space by the end of uh, this coming decade, and also by um, uh, reports from organizations like Gartner that talk about, you know, the, this coming year that the, the commercial cloud industry is worth $300, $330 billion dollars of, of, of revenue, and that's something like a 24% growth over the previous year. And then there's the disconnect, and the disconnect comes on the government side, which is only $7 billion of that $330 billion business. And that's only growing at something under 5% a year. So it's clear that there is an adoption issue with government and cloud technology. And, and we were looking at that from the perspective of space, and 
what uh, changes or what motivations need to be uh, rethought in the way that uh, both the government procures and the space industry and the cloud industry for space provisions uh, services. Um, and it, it was interesting for me sitting in on this for, on the first panel because almost all the points I'm going to make in the summary of our research, which was uh, uh, over a dozen uh, interviews um, over the last over the last eight months from both industry and and a, and agency leadership, and the industry was represented both at the application side and also at the at the cloud service provisioning side. Is that a lot of the points I'm going to make are exactly the same points that you heard. Uh, by our by our speakers in the first in the first panel, but they weren't thinking about it in terms of cloud. But the interface of cloud technology and the agility and the speed of transformation that cloud enables is indicative of the sorts of transformations that we've seen in other parts of the space industry. So a couple of major areas where government needs to rethink or reimagine the way that it operates within um, with the with its contractors in cloud for space acquisition agility i think is probably the first of those the pace of change in cloud technology as as um as as, as pan was talking about for uh, for the hardware side is faster than government traditionally procures and so um we need new ways of being able to acquire um, how to change our perspective from defining and buying widgets to consuming services. And that's something that, uh, that was spoken about in the context of SDA as well. And so once we look to utilize cloud, we need as a, on the procurement side to be thinking about getting out of the detailed definition of what it is we want, the requirements driven approach to a more abstract level where we're going to be buying services and allowing the industry to develop those services for us. Another aspect on the government side, which is key to the key to agility and a key to the urgency um, that was expressed this morning is the ability for governments to be allowed to take risk. We can't, we can't, we can no longer keep up with the pace of change if we only uh, if we're not allowed to fail. That doesn't mean failure has to be encouraged. It doesn't mean that failure has to be expensive. Failure has to be managed so that you can so that you can succeed in areas in the long term by taking steps and missteps forward and put that into a plan that gets you to where you want to be. Another aspect of buying services is this change of the of the acquisition environment from traditionally space has been go go government owned government operated. The future is going to look more like cocoa contractor owned contractor operated and then government is going to be less involved in defining those services government is going to be this is what I need you decide how you provide it tell me the cost of how you provide it. Another aspect that came out of our, our research was taking advantage of industry's willingness to invest. We no longer are, the government side of the business is no longer in the driver's seat. As I said, with the original, with, in the early uh, uh, statements about the value and the price of uh, the value of the market and cloud industry, that is driving the industry to invest and government needs to take advantage of that but isn't no longer driving it. We are going to be taking the results of that and say, that's a neat idea, I can use that. And lastly, I think the regulatory framework we need to look at. Space, at least the traditional space, the uh, comms and, uh, and earth observation is moving to an environment where um, it is no longer the domain of a small number of trusted providers. And so a regulatory framework, particularly for things like data acquisition, which requires tight control of data sources, either download, either, either downlinking to, a, to CONUS or into a foreign environment with a trusted provider. That is gonna to have to change. Our policies for, um, uh, for data acquisition are out of date. And we need to think about how we are moving to an environment where um, space is essentially just a place that we're doing work. We are moving away from the environment of 
can we do it, which is essentially technology driven to an environment of should we do it, which is essentially business driven. And that means that we need to be able to be thinking about how um, how the services apply to our business and not worry so much about whether space as a technology is something that we want to invest in. It's, is the business model right for the solutions that we want? And so, and so I think in summary for, for the points that we've, that we've come out of our research is, is three main points. We need to reimagine the way the government contract a relationship in to exploit cloud for space purposes. We need, um, we need to realize that for in innovation, government is not in the driver's seat. We can provide frameworks and standards for the infrastructure and the policies by which technology is going to interoperate for our purposes, but we're not going to be as innovative in the application of those technologies as, as industry is. And traditional space is just a place to do business and it's no longer the government's domain to innovate and to drive that as, um, as we have in the past. That's not, that's not, that won't be true for sort of things like exploration and other areas, but traditional space, space is just a business. I think that sort of sums up uh, where we are. Thank you. Okay. Super, and uh, we'll have time to, uh, then I think come back and do uh, Q and A. Um, so um, I want to give everyone a chance to, uh, to make their opening, opening remarks. Kind of like being in the tank, you get 10 minutes and then, okay. then the fun starts. Right. Sarah? Thank you so much. Um, uh, first, I want to thank GW and the Aerospace Corporation for having me, um, for Scott and Jamie for inviting me and my lovely personality, which is why I always get invited to these things. Um, my name is Sarah Monero. I'm the Senior Director for Space Strategy at Anderl Industries. We are a VC-backed um, we're a VC-backed defense tech company that pops out solutions for next generation defense problems, uh, specializing in a software first approach for kind of AI, ML applications. We're probably best known for some really awesome towers and Gucci looking drones. Uh, but at the end of the day, our real special sauce comes from the software that we uh, put onto those platforms. And quite frankly, um, we're looking at how we apply that software to next generation space architectures as, um, as Derek kind of referred to and as we are seeing in the commercial market. Uh, I think it's really important to kind of start with a couple of just really simple definitional frameworks because I think, and especially in my community and the communities that I run in, we use a lot of just tech bro -y terms that we, we throw out there and assume everybody knows. Like it, it's all you know, AI, ML processing and algorithms and you know blockchain and cryptocurrency and like Lord knows what else. And everyone just kind of nods and it's like, yes, fascinating. <laughs> tech, let's invest. Um, I think what's really important is to really have, um, and, and quite frankly, there's divergence in the taxonomy between AI companies as well. So I think it's important just to think about what we're thinking about and talk about what how we define kind of AI and machine learning, and then think about how we apply that to specific domains such as space. So let me just start there for a couple of minutes. Um, from a large kind of policy perspective, which is where I've spent a majority of my career, when I talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, what I'm talking about is really using machines uh, to do things that would typically require a fair amount of uh, human intelligence. And this is done using kind of pre-programmed algorithms, directive policies, rule structures, protocols um, to effectuate a decision. And essentially what we're really doing is approximating human judgment informed by machine-driven rule structures. Okay, so that when I talk about AI and machine learning, that's what I'm doing. Well, that's what I'm talking about. And this is more than just the Turing test or more than just can somebody beat can a computer beat somebody in Go or chess? Anybody can beat me in Go or chess, by the way. I'm not that great of a player. Um, but you know, the bottom line is that AI has really evolved since the 50s to the 90s to present day in, from what was essentially very complicated statistical modeling to more kind of neural network models, uh, kind of ont uh, ontological modeling, more kind of complex system modeling. 
And that's what you're starting to see now in a lot of these AI companies that are coming out, right? So for us that are looking at AI and defense applications, it's not about you know, creating a Skynet. It's not about necessarily uh, replacing humans. Most humans barely cognate, let alone cognate at the speeds necessary to be able to fly satellites conjuncting at 17,000 miles per hour. So uh, using machines to be able to think through that and using pre-programmed rules to be able to present the most efficient and effective COA for a human to make a necessary decision is what we're talking about in the context of um, at least part of the discussion of AI as it applies to space. There's a couple of quick rabbit holes to jump down when you talk about, again, AI and space. And the first, I think, was really brilliantly um, kind of introduced by uh, Derek and the work that he's doing on SDA and that kind of disruptive architecture. I mean, the bottom line is, is with the increasing com um, commoditization of space hardware, uh, with lower launch costs to LEO, what you're seeing is uh, space being more accessible as a place to gather data and to do data initial data exploitation. So using uh, AI ML kind of algorithms and processes to be able to uh, perceive, categorize, visualize, do anomaly detection, pattern detection on the tremendous amounts of space data that are coming down. What we're talking about today are now petabytes of data coming down from space-based architectures on a daily basis. So <clears throat> being able to sift through that and use and apply AI and ML techniques to that um, large amount of data uh, is quite frankly the challenge of the next space architectures, right? It's not the challenge of um, building a satellite and launching a sat satellite anymore. I think that's relatively commoditized. Um, it's not necessarily only the challenge of ground systems, which have been the Achilles heel of, quite frankly, most space acquisition challenges in, in the program of record. The real challenges today for space architectures and the real challenges for the next defense, the next generation defense architectures are going to be software driven and hardware enabled and architecting DOD acquisition programs to really test and challenge that software side of space and space acquisition is gonna be um, a real uh, sh necessary shift for the DOD to be able to recognize and, and codify and, and how they're approaching acquisition strategies. The second real trend is, again, while AI and ML is used uh, primarily uh, for kind of anomaly detection, perception, categorization, and visualization, you know, those same kinds of algorithms and rule-based architectures can also be applied not just to data exploitation, but to ensure data security and network security. And so, um, you know, taking those fundamental concepts um, and talking to them and helping to develop the network models, the network data, the network topology, data transport challenges, um, and optimization for complex task decomposition decomposition is something that AI and ML technologies um, can be used for. That last part is, you know, what starts to get into kind of what is termed mission autonomy. Mission autonomy in the context of space architectures is something that I think needs to be more robustly explored, um, both by the government sector and by the commercial sector. Um, but again, using AI and ML protocols to help define the network architecture associated with the space-based systems uh, is something that can help increase capacity and also decrease latency. And this is something that you see, you know, SDA also trying to think about in the context of their transport layer. Um, and the last real trend that I'm gonna talk about, um, and I talk about in almost any of these kind of space panels discussions that I do, is AI and ML applications and functions really at their core should enable solutions that don't, that don't necessitate a space only solution, right? Uh, quite frankly, if you're talking about data exploitation and the amounts of data that are coming down, um, 
data doesn't care where it's collected from generally, as long as there's a common referential framework for it, as long as there are kind of open standards that are available so that people can actually build applications at that application layer to exploit it and use it and push it down to tactical uh, users. Uh, you could probably run all sorts of AI and ML applications just to define what the heck anybody means by JADC2. It'll probably all fail. Uh, but, you know, there's a whole thing there about, you know, making sure that AI and ML applications are not just about space being for space sake, but also space supporting and being an integral foundational part for all of the other operational domains that we operate in. So that's, that's what I got for you. So we all think we're speaking a version of English when we use these terms, but they have different meanings for different communities. Surprise. Yeah. Sarah, the captain of obvious. All right. And now for somebody who is in the midst of all this, uh, Hank Su from, uh, from OneWeb. Hi, thank you. Um, hi. Just press. Hello. Thank you for having me here. Um, a lot of the comments uh, in the paper uh, that Stephen and Gerald are working on really resonate with um, the work that we're doing here at OneWeb. Um, so appreciate the opportunity to come and, uh, and, and talk with you all. Uh, so OneWeb, uh, we are a telecommunications company. Um, our goal is to provide uh, global broadband around the world through a network of um, low Earth orbit satellites. So we're going to have 600 plus satellites, uh, about 1,200 kilometers in, um, in, in orbit. Um, and they're going to provide uh, service for, uh, for users with uh, user terminals uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, so currently we have about 300 satellites uh, in orbit. We've been launching about 30 a month uh, for the last six months. And we are going to uh, continue that launch campaign uh, through, through next year. Uh, but the exciting part is, um, you know, even though we need 600 satellites uh, to provide complete coverage around the Earth, uh, we're actually in the position to provide some initial uh, commercial service for uh, higher latitude areas, such as Alaska, um, parts of Northern Europe, um, and, and uh, Northern Atlantic, so those areas. So, so that's actually coming up very soon um, in, in, in two short, less than two short months in November. Uh, so we'll be starting uh, to work with some of our customers and providing them service, which is a really exciting uh, time. And then from there, we're gonna just keep on adding satellites and increasing coverage uh, until we're gonna be able to um, uh, provide the rest of the, uh, the world with, uh, with, with broadband internet. Um, I think a lot of the uh, words we're talking about today, cloud, ML, uh, AI, very buzzy. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they're, they're very important for us. And for, for us, you know, it's not really, um, you know, a, a goal or, or an endpoint. It's really a means to an end, right? So, so these really are tools for us to put together our system and put together our business. Um, it's really no different at a very fundamental level from, you know, using a database or using a messaging system or using a server. Uh, it's just, you know, again, it's another, another, another set of tools uh, in our repertoire to kind of put things together. Um, so to that end, you know, we're, we're, we're applying these technologies judicious, judiciously, where, judiciously uh, where they're applicable um, and where they make sense. Um, if, if, if we're able to give them a try and they're able to add value, uh, you know, we want to definitely jump in there. Uh, but, but definitely doesn't necessarily mean that we have to kind of apply these for applying safe, right? Um, so really four things just want to leave you guys with. Um, you know, one, you know, what, what are our goals? How are these uh, technologies able to help us? You know, one, one is, you know, faster to market, right? So, so for us, uh, we have investors, uh, you know, we have a commitment to them. Uh, you know, we have customers, we have stakeholders that, that are counting on us to provide service in a short amount of time. Uh, so, so these technologies really do help us kind of cut the schedule down a little bit and get to where we need to go sooner. Um, a lot of times you have to go through a procurement process for hardware, you got to set it up, test it out, you know, bake it in, uh, and then put all the software on it. And there's a whole, um, you know, uh, process around that and time around that, you know, at the end of the day that, you know, those processes don't go away, but, you know, by, by, by leveraging some of these technologies, we can definitely shorten the cycle a little bit. Uh, maybe I don't have to buy as much hardware. Maybe I can just, you know, log into Amazon and, uh, and, uh, and turn some, turn some resources on tomorrow and, uh, kind of make it happen. So, so that's really been very powerful for us. Uh, number two, I would say, um, you know, doing more with less. So, so you know, we are a small company. Uh, we're trying to move very quickly, and we've, you know, we've taken on a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, big goals uh, that we want to accomplish. Um, and, and there's just not a lot of resources to kind of make that happen. So, um, if you look at traditional space operations, um, you know, a lot of times you have a lot of operators 
um, that are needed to provide 24 hour, seven day, 365 service uh, uh, and, and, and continuous operations for your satellite system. Um, you know, looking at a lot of, uh, you know, uh, systems that preceded us, um, if we were to use those um, operator to satellite ratios, um, you know, those numbers don't really work for us from a long term uh, longevity perspective. So, so a lot of times, you know, what we're asking ourselves every day is, you know, what can we do to use technology to automate, to minimize, to reduce, um, to kind of make things easier for us so that we can make the best use of our um, existing and scarce, scarce resources. So definitely want to you know take take advantage of that. Um, I would I would say three, um, which is interesting for the space domain, is you know making what we have um, last longer. So so you know most satellites, most spacecraft have you know some kind of limiting factor that affects the the life, life lifetime of the vehicle. Um, you know and that that really you know it's a big part of your business case or a big part of your budget. Um, so so if you're able to outperform you know, what your predictions are, then, then, then you can be in a very good place, right? So, so applying technologies um, like machine learning to kind of trend and look at out of family and see where things might be able to improve from an operational perspective to kind of eke out a little more time in your battery or, um, or, or a little more propellant, um, you know, that goes a long way. So, so being able to apply technologies like that to, to solve that problem um, has, been, has been very interesting. Um, and finally, I'll say uh, agility is, um, is, is, is been, has been really key. Um, I think that's been a, a big theme that's not necessarily tied to cloud or, or AI or ML, uh, but it's tied, been tied to software development for, for the last 15, 20 years. And you, know, you see it a lot in industry. You see it a lot um, in, in government uh, contracting as well. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of these technologies really are enable, uh, enablers for us to kind of um, exploit agility uh, when things go wrong or when the business model changes. You know, we're able to react quickly um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and kind of keep the ship uh, going in the right direction. Uh, no longer do we have to kind of say, hey, you know, I'm running out of this space. You know, it's just a matter of kind of signing on to, um, to, uh, to a web console and then you know, adding some space and, and, uh, and uploading your data there and, and, and kind of moving on. So, so in, in summary, um, you know, these technologies have been really important for us. Um, and, and they continue to develop, so they continue to be very challenging for us to, to apply. But, uh, but again, um, they're, they're, they're really critical in, in making it happen. And uh, hopefully in, in a few short months, uh, we'll be able to demonstrate uh, how that works. Thank you. Uh, it's terrific. It's exciting. And it, it meshes in with the first panel discussions uh, about satellite production lines and agility and where to, where to place that agility uh, in the system. Um, then the uh, next to the go to our uh, uh, showing how uh, IT savvy we are. We're going to a virtual panelist. Uh, so uh, Dan uh, Dan Brennan from uh, from Oracle uh, Mission Cloud Solutions. Well, good afternoon, uh, and I appreciate uh, George Washington University and Aerospace giving me the opportunity to talk to you all. Thanks very much. Um, just mic check, Scott. You can hear me. Uh, we can hear you fine, and I want to check to make sure we're transmitting the uh, the slides. The slides yep. are good. Okay, great. Thanks. So, so sorry, fellow panelists. I, I know the slides are behind you. I just have two or three. <laughs> Let's see. I'm a senior director at Oracle's National Security Group. So we were formed after 9/11. My focus is on space and ISR solutions. I spent my career providing. Uh, solutions to the government uh, from the Air Force to OUSDI uh, to the IC. And um, the focus right now, especially very topical to the conversation today, is how fast space is moving. So with that, um, as Scott mentioned, yes, uh, in the early 90s, my code's still up there. It's way past its shelf life, but we have a lot of technical debt in looking at how we manage space from the government side. And they know this. From a space domain awareness, we have over 4,000 satellites that have to be understood where they're at for conjunction analysis so they don't run into each other, uh, high accuracy catalog, clearinghouse for directed energy, uh, debris modeling. And so at the same time, if, if you talk to the commanders for Delta II, which I do, they, they're counting on analytics, they need Delta II is part of the new U.S. Uh, Space Command. They, they need data plane resiliency, okay, across 
platforms. So when you talk to the DOD and IC, it's all about resiliency. Recognized commercial is putting a lot of that in. I mean, from the 60s to uh, 2011, there were a thousand operational satellites. That doesn't count, you know, resident space objects. We got to about 2000 in about 2015, 2016, and now we're at about 4,500. Most of those, close to 72% are in LEO. Um, and, and of those, you've got a strong percentage that go around the pole. So keeping it clear that folks don't run into each other and get the debris issue with, with the gravity effect you've seen in the movies is key. The other thing that uh, the new service wants to do is digital engineering. So getting to market faster, those big satellites make them smaller, but uh, prove them out before they launch. So how does cloud help with that? Listen, this is a lot of folks, when they think Oracle, they think a database company, yes, we manage data around the world, um, but we also have 30 cloud regions and growing. Nine of them are out of our own pocket to invest in government regions, all without a contract. And that's being expanded. I won't say much more about this, except notice where we are not. Um, DOD has some pacing threats in cyber. So we recognize that and we recognize the DOD as our customer base. So this is my final slide, some things. What Hank mentioned, what Sarah mentioned, you know, uh, cheaper access to IC so that folks can get to the market faster. Launch is cheaper, what, what SpaceX did what Pam discussed earlier on the first panel is key. Now you have a cheaper access for commercial civilian and DOD at all security levels. That allows faster ability to configure your IT. What, what once took years, and this, this isn't that long ago. I mean, just 10 years ago, when you got a new contract, you'd go buy hardware, your engineers would have to rack and stack that, network it together, build the OS, build the platforms, takes years. What you, what you now can do on elastic hyperscale uh, cloud is really support the mission. So from Oracle's perspective, you have access to hundreds of thousands of compute cores, uh, petabytes, it's getting the exabytes of, of uh, resources. And, and so we have customers that actually can spin up tens of thousands of compute cores in just, you know, hours, days, use it to do something very unique and then shut that down. And they don't have to pay for that. Um, for space, once in a generation chance now, especially on the ground, to move to high performance cloud computing at a fraction of the cost. And these compete against the largest supercomputers on the planet. So when you're doing conjunction analysis, many on many, that can, with high accuracy, you know, special perturbations, vectors, that can get expensive. And, and when you need to do all this, you need that infrastructure that enables that. So um, what you're really after is trying to enable different business models in the commercial sector and mission intelligence from the DoD and IC, leveraging that vast amount of data. So what's now happening is, is from Oracle's perspective, we're taking machine learning and analytics and putting it into how we manage data. So we have an autonomous data warehouse, multimodal, for different types of data so that folks don't have to get into the details of how to manage the database, performance, tune it, uh, patch it, all those kind of things. That's, that's taken away because we have applied AI to our platform software. Same applies with data lakes and, and building in uh, machine learning that our customers can build upon. What's happening in AI and ML, let's, let's think about this. You have SMEs that can be on an operational floor that have data and they need to turn and twist that data, right? And you have streaming analytics that can help them with that. So really user-driven analytics, that's one. Second part is now data-driven applications, leveraging analytics. That gets a little more detailed, that's in the software development realm, but you're using services that are available to them to rapidly add value to the applications and to give decision models, courses of action, as Sarah mentioned, uh, to the end user. The third is data science. So data science, 
no, nobody has enough data sciences. So how do you apply these uh, convolutional neural networks in an easy way to allow the data science to build on what's coming out of academia? And, and that's another venue that we support. Now, key issue here is shared risk as, as aerospace mentioned, uh, Stephen did. And, and what happens when you move into the cloud is it's a shared risk model. The government has to trust cloud providers to do that. And with their contracts now for GWCC and what the IC has done to create a, a larger IDIQ multi-vendor is to, to understand it and really assess what commercial clouds available can do. So from our perspective, when you move into the cloud, you're no longer doing one-off designs. So when folks would do on-premise infrastructure, they, they'd pick from a, a large set of commercial capabilities, but each one could be kind of unique. So you have firmware that ages, you have software that ages that are not being patched on a regular basis. So what we did was we stepped back, built a Gen 2 cloud. Uh, the Gen 1 got faded away and we built in design security from the get-go, specifically on networks infrastructure platform based on zero trust philosophy. Next is operational security. We have cloud operation centers around the world and we have defensive and offensive security teams. This includes the DOD regions we've put in place, DOD and IC, I should say. And so think about this from a, a shared risk model. I already mentioned space has technical debt. So the cadence for patching COTS GOTS is probably not where it should be, but in the cloud and what we can do, scaled across the globe, as an example, back when Spectre and Meltdown bugs were happening about three years ago, we applied 150 million OS patches in just four hours with no downtime. So I wanted to just share before we got into Q&A the, the scale of what's happening in cloud along with AI and ML. This is innovating faster than any time in my career. It's tough for the government to keep up with it. I think the government has a challenge, especially when they want to internalize architectures uh, away from, let's say, commercial environments to keep up with this rapid pace of change. So I look forward to the questions. I'll stop sharing slides. Back to you, Scott. Thank you, Dan. And uh, I think there was some uh, some uh, great graphics uh, there making a, making a point about global operations. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, uh, I would like to have uh, Lindsay Millard uh, from the, the Principal Director for Space and, and R&E, uh, who is really on the cutting edge of this for DOD um, and uh, the sometimes painful bridge between where industry is at, where DOD culture and needs are. Um, and uh, I'd like to maybe have her talk about what is it that would be most helpful uh, from, uh, from industry or from other government agencies to uh, help her with her challenges. Lindsay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna first talk a little bit about my office, uh, what our you know, six technology areas are that we're concentrating on, and then I'll quickly talk about how we think that we can leverage the cloud. Uh, I'm gonna do that all in about four minutes because I have a lot of questions for our good friends at Aerospace Corporation. Uh, so my, my purview, I work for um, Honorable Shu, who's the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. And I'm tasked with coming up for a plan for research investment in the department uh, between basic research and prototyping. So academic research through actually launching stuff on orbit and DOD uh, parlance that's 6.1 to 6.4. Uh, and that's a really challenging ask right now because uh, we have an evolving uh, space enterprise and there are many, many players. And so what we've tried to do is identify uh, where we can really influence, where we can make a difference. Uh, so gaps and overlaps in where we're seeing investment across the board. Um, and we've couched the development of our roadmap in cis lunar space. So anything between the earth and, and beyond the moon. And the reason we're doing that is not necessarily because it's the purview of DOD to go into cis lunar space, but it offers a very challenging environment to push on technology. So tougher radiation environments and obviously much larger space. Um, so we're looking in that, in that area at exotic orbits uh, smaller satellites that can do more. 
um, and, and many other options, but, but our purview is beyond the moon. Uh, I was the program manager for the Space Surveillance Telescope, and I used to say we could observe tens of thousands of oceans over one quarter of the geo belt every night. Um, now I'm talking about, you know, obviously millions and millions of oceans, so, so giant place. Um, we're looking at, these are a little bit buzzwordy, but I'll get into it, uh, agile mission and assured communication uh, is the second area. So that, that includes um, new encryption uh, models. Uh, so looking towards quantum, looking towards updating how NSA can very quickly implement new encryption solutions, um, secure dynamic tasking. So how do we get um, the, the most important information to the decision makers as fast as we possibly can? And then also looking at standardization across um, different companies, different satellites, uh, different protocols. Um, the third area is intelligent systems. So Again, I think uh, many of the panelists have mentioned that AI ML covers all manner of evil. Uh, what I'm talking about here is being able to compute at the edge. And when I say at the edge, I mean having the satellite itself in its limited compute power uh, be able to do some specific tasks and interact with the cloud on the ground. And of course, zero trust, which is another buzzword. Um, we're also looking at engaging national and international um, space power is what we call it. Uh, that includes bringing in STEM, bringing in more of our workforce, our talented workforce, uh, academia in general, commercial and more traditional uh, aerospace corporations, um, and aligning and leveraging these other nations' investments with uh, what we are doing, right? Because we're better together. So if they are advancing in some area and we are advancing in another, let, let's work with that. Um, another thing specifically that we're doing relative to international cooperation is what we're terming the biophysical year. Um, so r &E is funded to collect data, uh, both from ground sensors, from CDC, and also from space-based sensors and NOAA, NASA across the board to try and understand how climate change might influence uh, pandemics moving forward. Uh, very unfortunately, we have a lot of data on this right now. And so the first thing is identifying where we're gonna store the data. Uh, the second is getting the data from the right sources. And then the third is gonna be performing analytics on that data. So that's something that's gonna be moving forward um, in the future. And of course, that would have to involve our international and commercial partners. Um, uh, the last one is sustained operations and reconstitution. Um, so what I mean by that is we need better radiation hardened equipment like FPGAs, for example, that are at the cutting edge. So if you look at what kind of FPGAs, what kind of ACE, well, not A6, but what kind of FPGAs we're, we're launching right now, we're 10 years behind the curve in some cases. So we, we wanna figure out a way to, to get what you have in your cell phone to be rad hard and work on orbits. Um, and we're also, of course, looking at responsive launch. And what I mean by that is not rapid launch. We have companies that can launch once a month. Uh, we're looking at what satellites do we need to have um, in a barn ready to go and how fast can we get them on orbit if we need them to go there. All right, so very, very quickly, um, so to support all of those, you know, five technology uh, thrusts, if you will, capability thrusts, uh, we need secure dynamic tasking that goes to getting the best information to, to where we need it to most quickly, uh, compute at the edge, how do we level, how, how do we interact with the small compute we have on orbit with the big cl cloud on the ground, uh, how do we balance that, again, the biophysical year obviously is going to be very concentrated on how we use co cloud computing and, and analytics behind that. Um, and um, I think I will, I will stop there. Um, so we have a few minutes for questions. Over. Okay, no, that's terrific. Um, I appreciate that, uh, that broad overview. Um, and uh, then um, in looking at some of the uh, questions uh, you animated, uh, maybe questions for Aerospace uh, Corporation, uh, maybe the uh, maybe the way to start uh, would be to have panelists ask each other what they would like. I, I've got a list of uh, thing, of you know, moderator privilege kind of questions, but that that's too easy. Uh, let me start with uh, asking um, uh, each person sort of what questions they would like to uh, to ask each other, and I'll start in reverse order. Lindsay. What questions would you like to ask one of the other panelists? I knew I was going to regret that. Um, uh, so one of the things that we mentioned is that government should take risks and we must be able to fail. Um, and I want to say I fully support that. I actually come from DARPA and I think that is really the only way to innovate in many cases. Um, but the counter to that in my mind is the government does need to 
in some cases, ensure that they can address national security needs uh, that are often defined by requirements. And so I guess my question is, you know, if the government says we're going to take risks, we're going to be able to fail, how do we still say that we can address those requirements? Yeah, so um, that's an excellent point. And uh, I do believe that when it comes to a zero trust architecture, um, you know, we're, we're talking about architecture not only at the fiscal layer, but at the software layer as well. Uh, and if you implement that zero trust architecture, um, then it's, it's almost like a human uh, anatomy kind of a scenario. At the cellular level, you have receptors that are capable of accepting or uh, denying, I guess, access to the cell. Uh, and then, you know, the immune system, uh, which is essentially the role of AI, can actually uh, come in and uh, identify a, a breach, you know, or a problem, uh, and then remediate that. So, uh, provided that we're doing that at the software layer, then, you know, failing fast or, or using agility and being resilient uh, shouldn't be as large of a concern because it should be baked into the system from the beginning. Um, so that's, that's one of the thoughts, probably other thoughts as well, Sarah. Yeah, so um, I always think this is an interesting question, especially in the context of uh, space and space domain, not uh, only for the Defense Department, but also looking at the civil side. And I think the bottom line here that people need to realize is that not all risk is the same. There are different kinds of risk. And so figuring out what kind of risk is appropriate for the government and for the DOD customers specifically to um, want to identify and mitigate versus the kinds of risks that commercial businesses will um, feel more comfortable kind of uh, acknowledging and absorbing based off of their own business case, their investors and their profitability are there's probably an, an informed discussion that needs to happen between the government customer and the, um, and the service provider or the uh, commercial provider about what kind of risk they can help each other kind of mitigate. Um, and quite frankly, there's a lot of um, policy and regulatory risk that uh, the commercial companies are just absorbing right now because they're moving at a pace that's faster than the current framework allows. And I think you see this most clearly in um, expo the export control regime as it relates to space software. Um, and so I think there's a really robust conversation to be had around the absorption of risk in space uh, from the different perspectives of the different players. And uh, I noticed that uh, our other panel, Dan, had his, uh, his hand up. And so, Dan. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay, great question. And, and let me build on a couple of things. Um, it's hard for, I would say, the US government to just begin from ground zero, like a greenfield activity. They've got a legacy base they have to go after. One of the things they're going after is efficiencies, let's say, just consolidation of ground operations very tricky, especially when they're doing things that commercial probably doesn't have to do. So if you were listening to the LEO panel at Space Symposium just three weeks back, uh, you, you had folks talking about doing AI and ML so they didn't crash into their own satellites, which is key. But, but doing that across constellations and understanding intent is very tricky for them. So in some ways, let's take it Let's take it near term. Um, concerns about infrastructure. So if, you, if you're tracking what SSDP is doing, if you're tracking what the Space Defense Task Force out of it, as he was after, um, I entered into a CRADA with aerospace for two and a half years to take a look at you know, supply chain risk management just on the infrastructure piece. And that led into our cloud discussion. But at the same time, if you step back, in the, in the community of DOD, it's, it's very much they're, they're reticent to move out of on-prem environments. And, and that is because um, they're buried in the rapid pace of launch. So they can't back up and rethink 
and bake certain things in. So they have to evolve. And I think what happened during the pandemic and it's still occurring is the realization they have to be able to code um, remotely to continue to make progress and still meet launch schedules that didn't slow down. So that was a forcing function in some ways. And I think the commercial community um, felt that I'm sure, you know, OneWeb's team faced that is, is developing remotely and that allowed them to break through certain barriers to understanding what cloud can offer and, and moving in that direction. Hopefully that helps. Back to you, Scott. Thank you. And uh, uh, Hank, did, any thoughts? Um, also a question you'd like to ask another panelist. Uh, sure, yeah. So uh, I guess from a risk perspective, um, having, having done some work uh, with, with the government in the past, I think um, you know, risk is uh, uh, something that if you can compartmentalize it, um, it, it becomes a little more manageable. Um, if, 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 uh, if, it's, if it's kind of at the farm type of thing, it's, it's, it's not something that the government can afford to do. Uh, given given their responsibilities and given what their scope is, so 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 I guess uh, from just my perspective, it's if, if it's possible to compartmentalize it and kind of break it down and take risks in certain areas and not others, uh, that would probably be ideal. Um, uh, shifting gears a little bit, my my question um, uh, mostly uh, targeted towards Sarah and Dan, but it might be applicable to the other other panelists as well. Um, so so I think you know Sarah, your earlier comment about data just being data and not caring. Um, and I, I think that rings very, very, very true for me. Um, I, I'm just curious if you guys see OneWeb as a space company or an IT company or a telecommunications company. Are we space specific, ground specific, or does it really not matter? And I guess from a you know government perspective, uh, I would be curious what your what your views on that as well. Uh, Sarah, do you want to go, or I'm happy to take it. Uh, why don't you start off and then I'll pile on. It's all good. <laughs> Hank, great question. Uh, I, I think broadband, and listen, I, I had to do kind of a, an analysis for Oracle for what's happening in space. And, um, and Stephen, I, I know you quoted 340 billion. The Space Foundation, who, who kind of runs the Space Symposium, Worldwide has it about 450 billion. And, and that has really evolved since SpaceX reduced the cost to launch. And to get back to Hank's question, I don't think it matters, Hank. I think, I, yes, we recognize OneWeb is a space company, but you're now into the broadband move data, you know, at the speed of light in space, which can reduce latency if you have deterministic routing that goes from the perimeter that you enter the OneWeb IT platform from an IPX somewhere on the globe uh, across your net and then when you exit. And I think from the government's perspective, if you have that kind of deterministic routing that when the packet is launched, you know where it's gonna come down at um, on the planet um, versus just a generic IPX in Canada versus, Chicago, Illinois, USA, that'll be key. Back to you guys. Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree with that. I, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, um, I'm less concerned about the specific domain that the data flies through. I'm more concerned that the data gets to where it needs to go in an operationally relevant amount of time. Um, and so if, you know, I am, uh, nerdily a huge fan of aerostats, which makes me super unpopular with all sorts of communities, uh, including the space community. But, um, you know, look, if you can use those kinds of uh, architectures uh, to be able to move the data around and do it securely, then, then I'm kind of agnostic onto the, you know, how high in the sky it needs to go, quite frankly. Um, you know, and this is also, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, other companies that I think classically people are like, this is absolutely a space company. So my example that I talk about pretty frequently is, you know, SpaceX, you know, people are like SpaceX is absolutely a space company. SpaceX is a, a phenomenal company that has done amazing things in space. Uh, I would argue that they are also 
really a phenomenal additive manufacturing production line capacity uh, where they have figured out how to take you know relatively high tech um, applications and hardware that is applied to the space domain but then they can pop it out and produce it at phenomenal rates um, witness what they're doing with Starlink and their terminals, right? And so um, it's kind of interesting, I think, uh, looking at how the space industrial base has really changed over the past 10 to 15 years um, and how software and software enabled companies are going to be able to uh, continue to change that industrial base as it moves forward. So I'm thinking of uh, Derek uh, Tonya's. Uh, comment about life cycles, you know, when, when does some of this agility stuff really, um, it's really helpful. And of course for cell phones, you know, a year, two year kind of cycle time is different than an automobile. Five year cycle time is very different than traditional aerospace, which is maybe, you know, 10, a decade to 30 years. Um, this issue of how do we conceptualize what business we're in, um, has, I think, a, a lot of power that I think we in the space community don't always, don't always appreciate. Um, as people know, one of my favorite pet rocks is GPS. And one of the um, uh, differences there I saw as GPS came about and is that uh, the companies didn't think about themselves, who were doing GPS equipment, didn't think of themselves as space companies. They thought of themselves as being in the IT business, uh, providing IT solutions. They were in Silicon Valley. Uh, they, they caught this kind of rapid production line. And so companies like Trimble um, and, um, and, and so forth uh, were really Silicon Valley kind of companies that happened to use the signal from space. In the policy world, when you went into uh, Europe, uh, they thought of this GPS as an aerospace product, somewhat like the way building Ariane space was or building maybe the Concorde or something like that. Uh, so obviously they cared about application, but their whole conceptualization of how to structure it was as an aerospace product. And in between, you had the Japanese, who at one point had about 60 80% of the car market, aftermarket. They didn't think about GPS as either a space technology or an aerospace technology. They thought of it as something in the consumer electronic aftermarket. And, and so uh, there was already a structure built up for that. And so you saw Japan um, really move out very heavily in the consumer electronic world and you couldn't tell on a packet that this came from a you know, DOD satellite uh, in space. So how we think about these things can have a big impact on the policy um, approaches. We just had this discussion, of course, about risk. And um, um, I think this is maybe an area for maybe some policy uh, or doctrinal clarification. Uh, there, in the Space Force, people talk about the difference between uh, using the traditional distinctions of combat arms, combat support, and combat support services. Uh, so something the Army had and it went away and it's something else now. Um, but I think it might make a comeback because plainly when we talk about requirements that really, really, no kidding, have to be met, we think about things like combat arms. We think about things that are like really important um, and, uh, and critical to combat arms, uh, but not quite the same than we maybe think about you know, support. support. We think about support services, like, you know, is the PX uh, fully stocked and are the lawns cut and uh, does the telephone work and how's the daycare center we're doing? These sorts of support services are things that are more susceptible to being sent out. So there's a risk assessment that goes on there that's driven by doctrinal uh, discussions about, about what's important. In your, so let me, let me get off my soapbox and, and ask back to the panelists, what, uh, in terms of sharing risk, what are the major misunderstandings, misinterpretations, or things people don't get uh, from industry and in government? If you're on the government side, what are the things that industry doesn't quite understand? If you're in the, if you're in the industry side, uh, what are the things that government doesn't get about you? What, what are the biggest translational problems that you've seen or, or run into? And maybe I'll start with, Aerospace and then work down. Or share all there. So I I I think so so from a government side, I think it's it it comes it comes down to the the satisfaction of requirement and 
there is very little uh, leeway from a government procurement perspective to um, uh, to waive requirements or accept um, alternative um, solutions for requirements. And so I think um, when uh, when you deal with industry that says, "Hey, we can we can satisfy um, this aspect, but we can't satisfy that aspect," that still is a is is a is a risk and a failure potentially on the government side. And I think it's government's responsibility to think about that differently. Um, the comment that, um, that that was made by uh, by Dan this morning is um, 100%, 100% satisfaction five minutes late is 100% failure. 80% satisfaction on time is an 80% success. And that's where I think the government needs to think about changing its, its approach in order to be able to work with industry because industry's approach particularly in this agile cloud environment is let's put it out there if it works great if it doesn't work we'll we'll do something else if it partially works we'll fix it and improve it and so the satisfaction of requirement is actually also not a fixed thing in time it's an evolving activity and so an understanding of what is your minimum operational capability that you can get that, that you can satisfy uh, your your emerg your important needs with or your urgent needs versus what is it which is the nice to haves that we should get to eventually down the line if we still really want to. That's the way I would look at it. From, yeah, from an industry perspective, there's um, a lot of opportunities here for misunderstanding. Quite frankly, I think uh, the first is. Um, uh, motivations and timelines, you know, what motivates a government customer versus what mo motivates a, uh, a commercial producer or provider. Um, you know, I think I worked about 18, 20 years in the government and, you know, did not have a lot of conversations about profitability or return on investment. Um, I think, quite frankly, now sitting in an industry seat, we do have those conversations and there's nothing wrong with having those conversations. If you didn't want to have those conversations, you could go to a country where there is no market and you're completely government uh, driven. Uh, that would probably land you in China. Good luck with that. Um, you know, so I, I think that's one thing. I think that also drives a lot of healthy discussion, not only on risk, but also on IP. Uh, especially when you're doing DevSecOps, you know, and, and you're looking at intellectual property, um, how that relates to the business case of the uh, of, of the company, um, but also where it's necessary, quite frankly, to meet with the government to be able to meet their needs so that you are avoiding um, the legitimate concern of vendor lock that the government does have. And so I think that there is um, there is room on both sides of that equation to have a robust conversation, and I think that should be had open and transparently. I think it is. I think a lot of people talk past it, quite frankly. Um, I think they should just have more blunt conversations. As you can tell, I'm kind of a blunt conversation kind of person. Um, I think the other thing here is timelines. Um, you know, the government thinks that you know, and the DoD thinks that popping out a a satellite in five years is pretty darn quick. I mean, when you talk about software enabled stuff and payloads and, and software drops and DevSecOps and I mean, we're popping out at Android software drops um, at the rate of once or maybe twice a week. I mean, we're going quick. So, um, you know, what we consider uh, near term is uh, not even fathomable to most government programs. Um, and figuring out, uh, again, just that basic uh, taxonomy of how we talk to each other and how we level set expectations early on, especially if you're going to acknowledge that a lot of the challenges for these next defense architectures are going to be software driven, having that discussion about how quickly we can get and iterate through a product um, to meet as much of the requirement on an expedited timeline and then continue to iterate to be able to meet the full requirement um, by the time things actually need to be delivered to the warfighter, I think is important. Um, so those are, you know, and then the last one that I'll say is there's, I think a really a genuine value, like a genuine 
valiant effort on behalf of the Department of Defense and Space Force and DARPA, you know, to try to reach small businesses and innovative businesses in this realm. I think they're well intended. I think, quite frankly, now there is a whole bunch of kind of innovation theater that's going on where people are getting, you know, $250,000, $500,000 to do some sort of thing, but there's no real transition into either a program of record or any kind of sustained profitability on the back end. And a lot of startups have a real hard time trying to figure out, like, you know, it, is that is that program, is that BAA or OTA something that I need to spend a significant amount of, you know, business development time pursuing, or is that only going to get me 500 K and then it'll never translate and transition into something, you know, more scalable into a program of record and figuring out again, this is something that r &E and that DARPA is intimately familiar with is how to scale that valley of death and, um, we certainly suffer that in the space community as well. So it sounds like what we, I think we were discussing about whole of government approaches. We're looking not only at what one department does, but also what other agencies are doing. And is there an overall strategy to then get toward an industrial base that can, that can scale up or does it remain kind of a boutique item forever? Um, we probably want things like nuclear weapons to remain boutique items forever. Uh, whereas things like rocket engines and cloud services um, have are certainly quite beyond just government. Uh, Lindsay, your thoughts? Yeah, so I completely agree actually with, with Sarah and your comments. Um, I think we need to meet in the middle, right? It's gonna be a it's gonna have to be a balanced risk approach. Um, when I was at DARPA, I I ran a program called R3D2. Uh, don't blame me for that name. Um, and it had one requirement that we gave to North of Brumman. Um, and I've also run programs in other places where we had thousands. Um, so it depends not only on the risk posture that the government's willing to take, um, but also on whether or not a contractor is willing to accept one requirement from the government, which can be um, challenging for that customer. Uh, because it's it, they would be running, you know, this is in this case a big aerospace company. They're running at a, a different pace than than they normally do. Um, so to answer Scott, your questions, um, some of the biggest challenges, misunderstandings we have on the side of the government. Obviously, we want, we want nothing more than to leverage commercial investment. Um, this is reiterated uh, multiple leaders every time we're we're in symposia like this. Uh, we need to work on contracting. I'll reiterate that um, it it is a huge bureaucracy. There are many policies um, and that is not conducive to working with companies that wanna move fast. And so we know that we need to work on that. Um, another thing that we often do is, is act as an anger tenant. Um, so we go in early to companies we think will be benef beneficial and make sure that they adjust uh, their businesses, if you will, to what the government wants to do. Uh, that is also a bit antithetical to having and leveraging a commercial business case if you're influencing it from the beginning. Uh, I would argue in some in some in, with some companies that's a very good thing to do, uh, but it, that's a decision that the government needs to weigh very carefully. Um, and you know, we, we definitely need to streamline our processes. Um, part of what we're asking industry to do that I think is a little bit potentially unfair, potentially challenging is to be interoperable with other companies that are potentially their competitors. And that is a very challenging question. You know, I think we could do a deep dive into that for an hour, but how do we, how do we get industry to be interoperable across the board while still encouraging them to be commercially viable? Uh, and I've had a lot of questions about that over the past week uh, at Amos. And I think that deserves a little bit of discussion at some point. So not only are the question, actually there's a government version of that question, which how, how to be interoperable with allies um, at, at different levels. And so one of the um, big, bigger barriers uh, to, uh, to uh, work is not just export control uh, laws, but cybersecurity. And it's the more the sense that space becomes a information driven sort of environment, uh, the issue of classification, uh, the issue at what level and across um, 
uh, allies and so forth is becomes really a, a critical problem. And in fact, a fundamental barrier. People may politically want to cooperate. There may be all kinds of will, you know, to do so. Um, but if you're still having to take things on an eight-track player into a skiff, um, you know, then or a floppy drive, literally, um, then there's going to be a, a sort of limitation. To that. So there's interoperability with competitors. There's also interoperability with you know, political and military competitors uh, or differences, I guess, that may be you know, like-minded. Um, so D Dan had that provocative slide that showed a big blank spot uh, in the central Eurasian landmass uh, in terms of where things were. Uh, Dan, uh, did you have a, a question or you wanted to, uh, to jump in on that? Uh, what I wanted to do was, uh, in your session where we could ask other panel members, um, I, I did want to ask Lindsay and Hank and maybe Sarah a question, if I could. Um, okay. Lindsay, you mentioned you know, compute at the edge. And so this does get the risk, Scott. Um, uh, the U.S. Space Force recently had some RFIs about compute at the edge. Um, they're, they're trying to innovate. And the, the real question is, is you know, 20 years from now, do I think we're going to have general compute in space with GPUs? Yes. Today, we don't. 15 years ago, it was microcontrollers managing the bus. Uh, we had ASIC development on SIBRs. Uh, we've moved into FPGA RAD hardened. Um, but that is not what SSC was after, which was if in the cloud, I have container driven Docker's Kubernetes those kind of applications built. Can I transfer that up to a platform in space to manage what SDA is trying to do with the tracking custody layer? And so they take really the cloud to space in some subset. And do you really see FPGAs as the future or is it more like smartphones where we get to rad hardened arms? And, and this question goes to any panelist member, but Lindsay, I wanted to get your take. Yeah, so I, I hope we get there. Um, there's actually an HP computer on ISS right now that's connected down to Azure. Um, and that was sort of one of the first things the government funded to, to do some demonstrations. Um, I think initially we're gonna have to start out with FPGAs only because if you look at SpaceX and, and many of the other companies um, here today, um, you know, they, that is what they're, they're on the ultra scale plus. And yep. so, you know, you know, I don't want to flash their their FPGA uh, every time you want to do a Kubernetes upgrade. So the challenge, I think, is, you know, is there a, a section? Is there, you know, I, actually, I think they have multiple FPGAs in that particular design. You know, can we take over one of those that that is a demo that that can connect down to this larger cloud on the ground? And the reason we're we're look so so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question. I would like to get to GPUs, but I think in the near term it's probably FPGAs. We're going to have to work with that. Um, but the idea here is, you know, if, if we have a bird on orbit that, and, and we want it to just flag if it sees some something specific on the ground, um, you know, can we use all the big data we have in the cloud on the ground to inform uh, and just update that um, indicator, if you will, to to the satellite on orbit? So there there are a lot of applications, but but that's one of the ones we've been thinking about. Well, let me just add a little rebuttal. In prep for this discussion and your question about edge in, in satellites, there is very little. Every company that builds a satellite doesn't publish the design artifacts for that satellite. It's, it's very much intellectual property. So as you move to the edge in space, what SSC is asking for, um, the modularization of what those architectures look like and the ability to move application AI ML to those units is very unique right now on a company by company basis. So I think one of the challenges as you look to invest is how, how do you start to get norms on vehicles for doing what we're discussing? Back to you. No, I, I completely agree. I actually don't take that as a rebuttal. Um, that's, some, that's kind of the world that, that we live in in this office, that, that is what we are trying to do. So I, I completely agree that you would have to look at standardization um, to, to move forward. Completely agree, over. 
Thanks. And I can't uh, help but wear the academic hat for a moment um, and uh, point out there is a, a wonderful book, which I'll recommend for people's reading, uh, by uh, Parker Temple uh, called Implosion um, on the history of rad hard ships and how much effort was put into making sure we knew how to build rad hard ships and then how we thought we could turn it all over to industry uh, and really step back from those standards and specifications. Uh, the cost and price that was paid as a result, and then rebuilding back from it. And so getting that right, um, you know, particularly in these areas where there's a mixture of government and the private sector, um, on one hand, you don't want to mill spec everything and, and tell people how to do their jobs. On the other hand, you have to lay out performance criteria and tests and things that you want people to actually be able to meet so that you know that they retain and you incentivize them to retain skills in-house that frankly wouldn't exist if not for the government demand. Um, and again, back to that, that shared, uh, shared risk model. Um, building on the question of the uh, FPGAs and so forth, does anyone see what the next thing would be in terms of, of uh, cloud-related architecture in space? And we talked a little bit about stuff you know, coming down. Uh, the, the Columbia mission, uh, believe it or not, back in 107, Last one um, had a successful experiment on board where we treated the vehicle as an FTP site on the internet. And we could actually do file transfers you know, back and forth uh, over it. Very primitive, but, uh, but uh, it, it sort of worked. And we know about delay tolerant networking and, and what you know, internet uh, uh, time sequencing uh, needs to be in space. But what might the civil community do? What might the commercial community do? What might the DOD communities do? Um, to uh, do services at the edge uh, in space, assuming some of these other problems could be overcome. What, what would be the, the next sort of target that people might anticipate seeing? So I'll, I'll, I'll chip in on that one. So to move, so, so just stepping back just a little bit to the FPGA, because I think it's, it's sort of fundamental to the underlying infrastructure. Um, I do see um, uh, uh, radiation hardening by software. As, as a potentially very innovative um, approach to be able to produce scalable commodity um, compute on, on, on satellite platforms. Presuming that we can solve that problem and get to that sort of scale of compute, then I think um, that one of the things that you'll begin to see is the increase uh, self-awareness and, uh, and automation of um, of satellite platforms, self-healing networks that recognize that um, a, a member may not be doing quite so well and either take it out of commission and replace it automatically or be able to um, provide services to those parts of that platform which is actually working from the constellation itself. Um, I think the idea of, of a satellite as a as, an in, as a separate autonomous node of its own is going to disappear and the autonomy will be at the network and at the constellation level and that is where you will begin to manage it. And that, by the way, is a necessary precursor if we're going to do uh, teleoperations out at, um, out beyond Cislunar because you're going to have to have these systems operating by themselves and being able to uh, make decisions and then inform the supervisor um, uh, so uh, as to what it's done and why it did it, and then to have strategic goals set by the supervisor rather than tactical actions um, uh, commanded. Get away from the um, three days to plan a 10 minute, a 10 yard walk on Mars. Um, take the supervisors out of the loop and put them on the loop. And if I could just add on to that, um, you know, a, a critical issue is just prioritization of communications, you know, ensuring that you're communicating the most important information first and some data that you have may not need to be communicated as quickly. So prioritizing that. Um, but also, you know, in terms of AI, there's, uh, you know, the building of the models and the, um, you know, the training of the models, it's very compute intensive. It can be done on the ground and you can field your actual models uh, to run at not just, you know, one order of magnitude less compute intensity and power consumption, but 
orders of magnitude less consumption. So, you know, I see a model in the future where a lot of the training is done, you know, on the ground and then fielding your models in space at the edge. Sort of like we, we got away from transitioning imagery from being on little, you know, bits of film that we transferred around in little closed boxes and looked at the film yep. to now we have petabytes of data coming down and we don't move that, you know, through even through fiber optics. Um, but we make data cubes and we, we really send the algorithms out yes. to go interrogate the data. Um, so what's at the edge can kind of change in, in the case of the data is not at the edge, but the user who has the need is at the edge and then the interrogation comes back yes. in architecture. Hank? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we're just at the beginning of this journey and it's actually pretty exciting. I mean, I think there's some stuff that's, you know, on the near horizon and there's some stuff that's, uh, you know, who knows what's coming down the pike. Uh, but I mean, like for... For us, I mean, we're looking at IoT, right? PNT. I mean, those are all cloud-like solutions that that uh, it's very realistic to kind of provide those from space. And there's a lot of good uh, terrestrial applications for uh, for those services. Um, and so that's a, I think that's a good example of um, you know extending these items to the, to, the, to uh, or extending the cloud cloud services into into space. Um, and then down the pike, I mean, it's just it's interesting just because in the last you know year or two, you see all sorts of ideas just kind of uh, germinate uh, in industry on, on on things that may or may not be realistic, but uh, but would you know start to smell like like a cloud in space, right? So stuff like uh, cryptology, uh, encryption, right, based based in space, stuff like uh, data storage in space, um, and, and and so forth. So I mean, it's it's uh, you're starting to see promises of what possibly can manifest in a couple of years. And I'll I'll add on to that. Um, I want to be clear. I if I don't speak for NASA and certainly not for Pam Melray, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be dangerous here. Um, some of the, the things that we've been thinking about to assist NASA in their Artemis mission uh, actually is to put a server in space um, to reduce the amount of time that, that you would need to get back down to the Earth. Uh, obviously, for astronauts, it would be on the moon. Um, and that would enable not only you know, an internet around the moon with potentially support satellites for that, but uh, also reduce the burden on astronauts of day-to-day -day activities. Um, I read a little bit about uh, everything they have to do every day, and and it's a lot of it's mundane, a lot of it is checks and balances. Uh, and so being able to have some kind of AI ML at that edge, uh, I think could be important. And again, because I'm in the office I'm in, I get to talk a little bit about the absurd. So thank you for uh, uh, starting that. Anyway, over. So the so the interesting areas I think of, of overlap. Not... Yeah, Dan. Go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, and, and and Lindsay, you were quite right. I, it wasn't a rebuttal; it was just an add-on. I want to add further onto what she just mentioned. You know, when you talk about ISS or or something on the moon, that makes absolute sense. What's kind of crazy right now is the commercialization of Leo and soon Mio. So, I'm very interested in, in what Hank is mentioning. Uh, in my work with aerospace and SSC, the real challenge, if you look at SDA's current uh, RFP on the street for their tranche one transport layer, it, 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 not to get into any specifics, but it's a tricky business. Trying to have optical and radar and have all that on to communicate data and manage power in the size that they need in LEO when you also need propulsion is tricky, tricky business. Uh, getting it in the right form factor, having enough power, being able to communicate all that data. And so as you think about trying to do things in space, data becomes key. How you replicate that and how you keep that data resilient um, while you have one-to-one -one communication channels between some high valuable assets is something they're still trying to you know, crack, how to do that. So I think, I think we start off you know, crawl, walk, run. We take a look at it, do some experimentation. Um, so that's why I'm hoping we move to ARM rat, rat hardened because that gets to closer general purpose versus, you know, the FPGA, which is still very much a specific language that doesn't translate to some of the languages used in cloud. Over. So this, again, I think comes back to the, so the philosophical question of how does as things move to the edge, what is the role of the users 
in then driving what the next need is. I mean, sometimes we look on it as then the users or people speaking for users uh, writing down really, really tough requirements, you know, some sort of fantasy wish list uh, that may or may not be possible that then requires tech development and all that. Um, whereas SDA has going through these cycling rounds and explicitly not trying to do new technology development, but is just trying to get the best they can to meet, uh, meet user needs. The next, how do we how do we continue to manage it? Can that can that be formalized in some way? Is SDA always going to be kind of like a, a special case, or are there other broader areas where that kind of approach, um, you know, is appropriate? Um, I'm thinking particularly that we're not taking advantage of all the things that are in the cloud, not just because of the dollar value, but if I look at the hundreds, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of software engineers, there's no way the government is ever going to match the scale about what's already happening out there in, in industry. So how best do I take government user needs um, and provide a, a way for that to be expressed? Um, at one extreme, there's, you know, basically space as a service. Um, there are others that are, you know, more partnership related. Um, so if anyone wants to sort of speculate on that hard problem. Yeah, just to just to kind of start off, I guess. I mean, uh, what I, what I said earlier, uh, just kind of a flip comment about you know compartmentalizing risk. I think that goes hand in hand. I mean, um, I think I think if you went in the spectrum, you hire ten thousand software engineers and start building something from scratch, I and mean, you're taking on a significant amount of risk, and there's going to be a high probability of failure or, or coming up short. Um, the opposite of the spectrum, you end up buying everything off the shelf, and it's not exactly what you need, but uh, but maybe it's more reliable, and maybe it works. Um, I, I think the answer is kind of in the middle, right? So so you you kind of take some things off the shelf that are available, and use those as building blocks or kind of core anchor pieces of of your overall solution, and then you couple that with some custom develop targeted custom development, and I think that really kind of helps manage your risk, right? Because uh, you know hopefully if if you, if you do it right, you know, your, your anchor tenants give you some capability that's, that, that's, you know, guaranteed, quote unquote, right, uh, more or less. And then, and then, you know, you can build some stuff around it. And, and if that doesn't go as well, well, you know, you're not, you don't have to start off at square one. You can, you can try to, you know, maybe uh, replan a little bit and try again. And if you're not, you're not really paying for, you know, this humongous uh, program from, from scratch. So from kind of our point of view, um, and we're privileged in so far as we're a VC backed defense unicorn that got valued at $4.5 billion in under four years of establishment. And how do you do that? Well, you, your company is founded by a billionaire. And then all of a sudden his next company gets valued at a couple billion dollars. But, you know, uh, the approach that we take at Anduril is quite frankly not um, chasing the current validated requirements or chasing the current program of record. And it's why we talk about ourselves as the next generation kind of defense company. And so what we end up doing is using a lot of our VC money um, to basically I read our own kinds of solutions and then participating in a series of experiments, demos or other things that get us in regular contact with the defense department and with the end user customers so that we can then iterate through our product to be able to give them something that is actually going to meet their needs. And quite frankly, in most cases, what we end up providing them is something that we've kind of imagineered um, into existence for them that they didn't actually even realize that they wanted or needed or, or that was out there. And those are the kinds of Steve Jobs kinds of questions. Yeah, it's pretty nerdy. I live in a pretty nerdy world, but it's also super exciting, right? Because we do have the flexibility of allowing our VC funds to basically float us and relieve that pressure valve um, so that we can have these in-depth conversations with operators and with the government customer about what they actually want. And then we negotiate kind of um, IP and licenses and, and um, base everything off of our commercial price list so that we can provide that to the government on a firm fixed price at the lowest amount that we, we can. But we're quite frankly, very happy to independently or VC fund or, you know, I read our own kind of product solutions um, and create that, that iteration with the government. And so that's kind of how we've approached it from a business case perspective, but we're in a relatively privileged place to be able to do that. 
so, so, so there's an analogy here, which I think a number of people have been sort of alluding to with the technology itself, and that is moving to an environment where the government is on the loop rather than the government in the loop. And by that, I mean the government is, has been used to in the space industry because the government has been the prime beneficiary of the space industry for over a generation um, and specifying the requirement of what they need. What we really need to be moving to is an environment where the government is defining the behaviors that they expect from the solution. And, and it's then industry's responsibility to provide solutions that correspond to the behaviors that the government uh, wants. And that's also true in the regulatory environment. We shouldn't be necessarily regulating technologies. We should be regulating behaviors and allow best available technology to be able to implement those those regulatory behaviors and i think if you if government can find a way to move into that that role that perceive that that that's its role rather than specific requirements then i think that will enable the investment it will, it will enable the demand signal which industry will then be willing to invest against because the requirement is the behavior not uh, a specific set of regulations or specific set of uh, capabilities but of course, uh, the challenge then is prioritization. Um, so the government will will always probably come up with something that will be self-contradictory. And the question then becomes is what matters more than others or what are you willing to trade off uh, for that? So we have issues of interoperability you know, versus cybersecurity uh, versus risk sharing. Uh, these are sort of the sort of core policy issues. and. Uh, what it does suggest is that you should probably, industry should not try to substitute itself for those judgments, but they can provide a variety of options. But ultimately, the government has to be responsible for figuring out where it wants to put the setting um, in terms of uh, carrying out its mission and the taxpayer trust, which in turn means the government needs a certain amount of intellectual capital inside, um, as opposed to just being the world's best COTRs. Um, and, and this is a longer subject I don't propose to do sort of now, but how do we make sure the government is able to do these things, that it has the skilled uh, people necessary to even make that setting? We, we understand it can't be everywhere, but it has to be a smart buyer. It has to understand what the policy trade-offs are. Um, and those are not things that you're gonna necessarily do in industry, nor do you wanna outsource uh, to industry to do, to do that, I see. I, I think, Lindsay, did, Lindsay, did Lindsay, did that spark something? Uh, yeah, I can chime in very briefly. Um, it's really interesting, the concept that you say you got moved from requirements to service-based. Um, that is a long conversation, and I need to think about it more. Uh, but in terms of what Hank mentioned, meeting in the middle, it got me thinking that um, there are some secure communications that we are only going to send over our government satellites with requirements. Um, but on a bad day, you know, we're going to look to whatever path we can get to, to move those communications uh, back down to, to the places we need to get them. So I do think it's meeting in the middle. Um, you know, I don't think any company is going to necessarily sign up to do a commercial nuclear red line, which is what I'm referring to. Uh, but certainly we will rely on them um, if we need to do that. And obviously there are many communications we send over commercial already. But I, I was just thinking of that trade-off between, you know, we need to be very sure about certain things and then leverage commercial wherever we can bring them in. That, that was the only thought I was having. Okay. Um, and uh, I want to take advantage of the fact of we do have some margin and our head of schedule to maybe give, um, be respectful of people's time uh, and generous today. Because I, I want to do sort of just one more roundup as to uh, what sort of takeaway message did each of the panelists receive from the discussion today? Or was there a message that they wanted to footstop and, uh, and transmit, uh, transmit again? And I'll just go down the, uh, I'll just go down the sequence and start with uh, uh, Steve and then Cheryl. Okay, uh, thank you, Scott. So, um, so being a Brit, it's my obligation to misquote Isaac Newton at least once in these um, uh, sort of sessions. And, and, and what I want to say, to say is, is, is that agile behavior and flexibility and, agile, and 
uh, ability to address the urgency sits on the top of the foundation, sits on the shoulders of, of, of infrastructure and investment that has happened in the past. And so when we come back to talk about uh, risk and we talk about innovation, we need to be we need to realize that that is based upon the work that's gone before. And there is still a role, I think, for government in those areas where there's not yet a business case available for industry to go and innovate and just speculate. And that conversation, I think, um, still has to happen. I think to a large extent it is over in the um, in space-based communications and the observation arena. I think it's just starting in space-based autonomy and, and um, the broader space economy. Thank you, Charlie. Yeah, I just want uh, to mention a couple of things. Uh, I really appreciated the agility comments that were brought forth by all of the panel members. And uh, what I would love to see in the government is um, a change in writing contracts so that you know government can actually acknowledge I have a 80% idea of what I want, but I need to be able to actually iterate on those requirements so that once I see what's being developed, um, that I can actually get what I really think I want, what I really need. Um, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's it's a common practice that I learned to do rapid iterative development testing and evaluation. And, you know, to speak to the cadence that Sarah described, you know, you can have new rollouts of stuff that happens on a daily basis, weekly basis. And when you put that in front of your stakeholders and say, is this what you want? And the stakeholders say, wow, yeah, and that sparks this other idea. I really would like to see this other thing on top of that. Uh, it provides that space within the contract and with the engagement with industry to actually innovate and create things of, of great benefit to government. So uh, that's, you know, from the discussion today, I would love to see uh, more contracts along those lines. It's not quite as agile as that, but this is where maybe a uh, conversation between uh, DOD and NASA might be helpful. The, um, uh, for the Artemis program, uh, NASA has written a series of, of contracts. Or they're not quite all performance-based and so forth, but they're very, very flexible. So thing where this, the pressure suits or the landing modules or communications, they're able to cycle pretty quickly and they just add these like a little additional um, modifications, uh, almost like an IDIQ kind of contract. So they have a large area they're covering, but then the contract mods and responsiveness are, are pretty easy. And I don't know if DOD has anything quite like that or if it, uh, if it, if it fits, but there are models. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Sarah? Uh, yeah, so a couple of things. Again, thank you um, for having me and, uh, and my sparkling personality. Uh, look, I think that there's a, a couple of great things here. I think, um, one, uh, acknowledging the role that software will play in solving space requirements for the next generation of kind of space defense architectures is hugely important. I think that relates to looking at the growing industrial base that's going to support um, space and space programs in the future to include, uh, you know, software providers and non-traditionals and, you know, people that have and companies that have experience in, um, you know, relevant areas, but are maybe one or even two sigma off from the norm of where you would look for a space industrial participation. Um, I think having clear conversations about expectations, taxonomy, and um, you know, NIP are are important. And I think, quite frankly, you know, all of us do space because we're we're usually. I've never met a space person who isn't a painful nerd, right? We're all nerds in some way. I mean, there really should be an acknowledgement that, you know, we're doing this, whether it's on the defense side, whether it's on the NASA side, the civil side, because we're fascinated by um, the universality of working in the space domain and, you know, figuring out how to be cross domain, um, interagency uh, and look in international in figuring out how to leverage and optimize what we're developing and why we're developing it is something that I think um, all of the industrial base should be looking for. And I won't forget Dan. 
Um, so I, I just want to say um, we want to do better, right? We want commercial. We want to be agile. Agile. Uh, we want to be interoperable, uh, both classifications and and with international uh, partners. Um, there are many agencies where we don't want to be afraid to fail. Again, I mentioned that's how you innovate. Completely agree. Um, so I guess be patient with us. Um, there is a huge inertia, a huge amount of folks that are learning how to work with um, AIML with cloud computing better. And uh, I, I am one of them. Um, in some cases, you know, to change the FAR, um, the, the federal acquisition uh, regulations, uh, you know, can take an act of Congress um, or the Secretary of Defense. Uh, so, so bear with us, we, we do want to do it. We're working towards it. Um, and you know, we, we will get there uh, iteration by iteration. And I also wanted to thank all the panelists here uh, for the education I got today, for the incredibly uh, fun and intellectual and nerdy conversation. Uh, and also thank you to GW for, for putting this together. Thank you. Um, I, I'm excited. So um, th thank you to everyone for the, um, the, the great discussion today. I mean, I learned a lot about what everyone's doing. Um, you know, to be just uh, on a personal note, like um, you know, rewind a couple of years, I, I wouldn't have joined OneWeb and I would not have taken on this, you know, fast track, low resource uh, opportunity um, if I didn't think I could be successful. And the reason why I thought I was successful or could be successful is because of all the great work that had been done before that. So cloud technologies, uh, technologies derived from the cloud, uh, technologies that you know were, were made popular by the cloud. I mean, these were all things that you know when I when I was you know going through my job interview, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, we could do this because this has been done before. Um, and and just talking to you all today, it's it's very exciting to see kind of the work that's being done on the supply side by industry. Um, it's very exciting to um hear about the demand side from the government right because all of these add together to um you know change and improve where we are will and will be in two or three years from a space 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 industry perspective and i think uh the opportunities and what we're able to accomplish um will be will be even more impressive than kind of what we're talking about today so thank you super yeah well, well i'd like to thank not only gw and aerospace but also all the panelists this was a, an exciting conversation to have. Uh, it's got me thinking about several things. I may need to follow up with a few of you. Um, some things to highlight. I think it was Sarah who mentioned, you know, the future is it, for spaces regarding software. And I'd like to add on to that. I think we're at the cusp of how we apply AI and ML inside DoD. And two of the first places that may occur is in cyber and space. The financial markets, the telecommunication markets have adapted it. Those models are deployed almost every three weeks, especially for fraud detection. Um, and we're just not there yet in, in government thinking about their requirements. Um, I recognize the commercial space community has rapidly adapted that. But if, if you talk to some of the PMs, they're, they're still a bit hesitant to get there. So definitely want folks to acknowledge and, or understand that the role of compute and the analytics power of the cloud is there to enable solutions that can help us with the contested, congested environment. Um, we've got a lot of debt on the ground side in the government and recognize ground is as important as vehicles across the FIDA. I don't think that's funded well enough. Um, so, Again, thanks for GW and everyone on the panel for having this opportunity to discuss these items. Thanks much. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's great. And I really wanted to thank all the panelists for taking the time out today and engage. And I think one of the fun things about doing these kinds of panels is uh, uh, hopefully the audience is entertained, but I think participating on the panels, you get to meet your other panelists and uh, uh, get to know them. And uh, uh, this part of uh, uh, building the space community, uh, which we're where we take great pride and pleasure. So thank you all very much for being here. And that's uh, that's it from uh, Space Policy Institute to George Washington University and our partners in this, uh, the Aerospace Corporation. And uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.